right. Well, welcome everyone to the third year of the Global Biodiversity Festival. So from Friday through Saturday for three days, we'll be celebrating the weird and the wonderful, the challenges life faces, and some good news conservation stories with our guides being the scientists, conservationists, filmmakers on the front lines of studying, documenting, and protecting our planet's incredible biodiversity. So day one is already on the books, Friday evening, we had a great series of events that saw us traveling across four different continents uh, to meet some incredible scientists and explorers and researchers and documentary filmmakers and conservationists who shared the passion for their work they're doing and their goal to protect our planet's biodiversity. So my name is Joe Grabowski and I'll be one of the hosts throughout the weekend. I am one of the founders of the festival and I am also the founder and director of an organization called Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So we bring science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live into classrooms uh, across North America and around the world through virtual guest speakers and virtual field trips. So we've been doing this since 2015. We've hosted well over 3,000 live events, connecting a half a million students with scientists and explorers from 95 countries around the world. What we do is and always will be free for classrooms everywhere. And if you want to check out uh, some of our work and the events we have coming up, you can visit exploringbytheseat.com and find out all about what we do. So um, the Global Biodiversity Festival is a virtual weekend for the general public with a simple goal of shining a spotlight on biodiversity loss. It happens every year around May 22nd, which is the International Day for Biological Diversity, and we know that's coming up tomorrow. If you missed any of Friday's events, don't worry at all. We have a playlist that we're going to put up online. Right now, you can see the whole list of events together and watch them in one big file. But we're going to start putting the events up one by one by one individually so that you can pick and choose the events that you may have missed. So let's get this morning started. We're going to start off in India. We have a great speaker who's joining us now. We've got Momita Chakraborty joining us. She is a conservation biologist specializing in birds and mammals. She's currently doing her PhD uh, from Wildlife Institute in India, working to understand how anthropogenic and environmental factors control changes in red panda distribution in Sikkim. So she's associated with the ZSL Edge of Existence program. As a National Geographic Photo Arc Edge Fellow, she has spent the last three years in Sikkim conserving red pandas through various research, education, and communication activities. I'm going to bring her in live with us right now. Hey, Momita, how are we doing? Hi, I'm fine. Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. It is so great to have you joining us today. I got a little sneak peek at some of the little videos and pictures you have, and I'm so excited for you to share uh, a little bit Thank of the world so of the Red Panda with us today. Thank you so much, Joy, for inviting us for, for the presentations. I'm really yes. be honored to, to, the, 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 to show my uh, work, to showcase here, this platform. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we've got your presentation ready to go. We'll let you take over for a little bit. Sure, sure, definitely. I'm, I'm starting then. Can you show this? Can you, is it visible to the yep. screen? Yeah, it's nice and full screen. We see the red panda staring right at us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, okay, fine. So I'm going to start, okay? Absolutely. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, First, a uh, little bit of myself, uh, already Joe introduced. Uh, my name is Momita. I'm working on red pandas since last three and a half years. I was associated with uh, WI as a PhD fellow, and also I'm a Nat Geo Photo Arc Edge fellow. I'm also doing on red like doing the project, the, the independent project on red panda conservation, which is spatial prioritization for the conservation of endangered red panda in Sikkim Himalayan landscape. So I'm starting with the, my presentation, which is Save the Himalayan James Red Panda. Before starting this, I wish you everyone happy International Biodiversity Week and tomorrow is happy International Biodiversity Day. So, so yeah, it is our duty, our duty to take care of our environment, our nature, our, our wildlife. So starting with a, a small clip, which I got it from Nature and Focus, which is a red panda twittering call, which is, I think, like you enjoyed a lot to heard about this call. So yeah, we all know red panda is elusive and mysterious species in the Eastern Himalayan landscape. So why they are mysterious in nature? So let's come to the point. Yeah. 
So red panda is only living representative in Allevidi family. So yeah, so long back, so red panda and the giant panda, like they have some, like uh, it was a confusion between of these two pandas. So which is the giant one and the red panda one. So I have shared one study, which is revealed the comparative genomic reveals convergent evolution between giant panda and red panda by who et al. 2016. This is a very recent study. So earlier it was like uh, people like they're confused with the giant panda and they used to thought he, that, that that is uh, comes under the Uricidae uh, family. But no. So the current study, the comparative genomic study, which completely shown a different results, which red panda it belongs to a single monotypic family which is the allergy family and it is only the representative species uh, in that particular family and i'm i'm sharing one my screen here you can see the particular the species red panda is here so uh, and recent one of the studies which reveals that red panda earlier it was like two different subspecies one is Alurus fulgens fulgens, it is, uh, and another one is Alurus fulgens tani. So when now currently studies show that it is a completely two different species, which one, the first one, which is Alurus fulgens fulgens, is comes under the Himalayan red panda, and another one is the uh, uh, Chinese red panda. The, that uh, Himalayan red panda is like uh, completely uh, distributed in the full patches, the whole patches of Western Himalayan landscape, which is uh, the starting from Nepal, India, Bhutan, China and Myanmar, but the uh, the single species, which is Alurus fulgens tani, which is the only isolated isolated into the China uh, China China region. My second slide is to like their habitat and diet specialist. So I, I here I also mentioned one paper, which is uh, pu one publication, which is habitat requirements of Himalayan red panda and uh, threat analysis in Jigmidorje National Park, Bhutan, by Denduk et al. 2020. That paper actually reveals like uh, this uh, species, like the red panda, is a habitat specialist because they preferred a certain habitat. Means uh, they preferred only temperate forest, temperate broadleaf, or temperate like mixed conifer temperate forest or uh, the and uh, the subalpine forest so they're only uh, that particular region they preferred to st uh, the to stay in the particular forest and with some of the criteria like the altitude which the preferred altitude is like 2500 to 4000 meter altitude and some they they are diet specialists because as we all know red panda belongs to the carnivora but still we uh, they are herbivorous in nature because most of the diet is like the bamboo which is arendaria species which arendaria malin and arendaria uh, uh, arendaria malin and uh, arendaria aristrata and the dendrocolumbus strictus these three usually these three species used to eat red pandas and some of us they have slow preference aspects they have the certain aspects they preferred and also the play the, the vegetation type as as well because they used to stay in particularly some uh, specific trees so like the oak tree the specifically the oak oak trees the quaker species and some rhododendron species uh, so they used to prefer such particular habitat or particular diet for their lifestyle so that is why their habitat and diet specialist coming to the next slide which is indicator species so red panda is also an indicator species so the the, the next paper is the publication uh, the selection of red panda as an indicator species in singalila national park roca at all 2019 author reveals that like the uh, they categorized into two different uh, categories the first category they uh, the the positive indicating category was like the the high the higher chances of red panda occurrence and the low chances of the pressures anthropogenic pressures or natural impacts whatever so that indicates the like that that indicates positively like that indicates a good forest patches and the negative is like the the lowest chances uh, red panda occurrence and the highest pressure in that forest that indicates the 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 like uh, disturbed forest uh, so likewise the author uh, like uh, specified as an indicator species in their particular paper so yeah 
so all these causes actually leads to the endangered species ultimately because they are very sensitive species shy species at the, their habitat so ultimately uh, red panda is categorized under the threatened species by icn red list so it is uh, categorized as an endangered species and site uh, site like appendix one species in sites as well so uh, i have mentioned there some assessment reports which we can see like uh, in 1988 there were no data as such so that they were they are as like they were as like insufficiently known category and after that in 1994 we can see they are categorized as a vulnerable species and followed by 1996 they they're categorized again the endangered species again 2008 the population maybe the population was increasing and it can it categorized in the vulnerable category but unfortunately in 2015 it is again listed as an endangered species in ICN red list so the estimate the estimation total estimation is 10000 individual in the wild but the, the thing is it is decreasing in in their population trend so yeah so this global biodiversity phase is basically like they're more into the weird, weird species weird and wonderful species so i i believe red panda is belong to this particular category like they're really weird and really wonderful species so wherever they're they 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 are in the habitat and they're they itself are weird and wonderful so i have mentioned just two three points uh, which is there i already discussed they are vegetarian carnivore means they're they're carnivora but they are vegetarian in nature, means herbivores in nature. So they used to eat like Arundaria species, two of Arundarias and another one is Tentaculum astrictors. Uh, uh, almost 81.7% they eat bamboo, bamboo. So by Pantheatol 2012. And apart from that, there are a couple of species like, uh, like 10 species as I've mentioned there, the fruits and leaves they're also, they're also eat sometimes like i have mentioned all these names there also so yeah especially they in uh, they eat in summer like uh, some of the species is uh, rosa sericera another one is rubo species and in post monsoon time they used to eat the sorbus cuspidata the fruits of sorbus uh, sorbus tree which is uh, the sorbus cuspidata daphne diacolosa and uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the leaves of rhododendron arboreum and aconagulum moly. So yeah, there are a couple of uh, uh, even research papers has shown uh, certain species. Uh, in 1990, uh, Pradhan et al. declared some of the uh, species name, which is Acer sp, uh, Barbaris sp, and uh, some of the lichen species they used to eat. So there are a couple of couple of uh, other tree leaves or fruits in their food uh, like in their diet please the next is the pseudothumb so they have their own enlarged modified wrist bone which helps in their locomotion so uh, as we all know red panda is an arboreal species they used to prefer trees uh, for resting for roosting and for breeding purposes so so this pseudothumb helped for their locomotion on many purposes as you can see in the picture, which is the camouflage, the, 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 the point is the creature of camouflage, and you can see all, already red panda and, the, and its camouflage in nature. As we can see, the, all this, like it is like re their reddish coat and their face marks is almost camouflaged with the red brown mosses. So yeah, it is really camouflage, cam like they're like it is really camouflaged with the, their habitat so that it is really hard to find once you go for the survey. It is really hard to find in the nature, in the wild. And they usually prefer the top branches of the trees. So it's really hard as they are very shy, camouflaged in nature. So it's really hard to find in, in the wild. So yeah, so this is the, the global distributions of red panda it, in five different countries. Uh, you can see in the points here. So the countries are the ne Nepal, 
India, Bhutan, China, and Myanmar. And in India, there are four different states which holds red pandas habitat. The starting from Arunachal Pradesh holds the most of this habitat, followed by Sikkim, Upper West Bengal, and some part of Meghalaya. So some of the, in the studies, which uh, like one recent research by Kaki et al. 2020, so they they highlight highlights many different papers. Actually, this is a review paper by Kaki et al. And they reviewed at least 193 papers and some some informations that some interesting information came out here. So you can see then the first graph uh, uh, from the you can see from 1827 to 20, 2020. So you can see the graph. So the graph was the earlier stage. The graph was will have very low and it day by day it comes higher that means the article that me that means the number of article is generating so that means the research is like like many publishing the, the paper like there is couple of paper is like is generating that means the research the number of research is increasing so it's a good good sign so because it's it's a rare species it's an elusive species so always red like red panda monitoring is needed for their their conservation in the second graph we can see the the chart where the the number of articles like in the the black denotes in the wild and the gray denotes in the captivity so earlier it was to like in captive study only but nowadays we can see in 2010 20 papers the wild study is increasing. So that is a good sign for red pandas. As we know, that's very good sign for red pandas and it is quite on peak. So more studies, more publication, that means that is a, that is a good sign for red panda conservation. Yeah, but the, the thing is, the latest paper by Gladson et al. 2022 is 60% of the red panda habitat lies under outside this protected area. So in the last slide, what we mentioned that is a wild that wild denotes only basically only the protected areas, but where the non-protected sites, because red panda is like uh, distributed in protected and non-protected areas both. So so even the Gladson et al. study also highlight 60% protect like 60% red panda habitat lied outside of this protected area in Sikkim. This is for Sikkim only. So where I'm recently studying. So yeah, these papers are really interesting papers, but they only studied in protected like protected area network. So very less studies have been done so far in Sikkim in non-protected area, but still a uh, couple of studies are recently like uh, going on like recently a uh, couple of studies are uh, highlighting and the major thing is why i'm choosing the particular thing just because there are very less studies of in, in, like there are very less studies in non protected habitats in sikkim so my edge project were like is to enhance the protection of existing habitat both in protected habitat, like protected land and non-protected land of red pandas in Sikkim. So in my study, we I covered seven protected area and 16 non-protected areas. And this, uh, uh, this sky blue is denotes the protected lands, the seven protected lands. And this green area, light green area denotes the non-protected sites. So interestingly, the presence act, the presence was confirmed in six protected areas and seven non-protected areas in Sikkim. So that is very interesting uh, outcomes actually. So, so what we were do like what we have done so far, we looking for the sign, vegetation structure, threats in respective protected and non-protected sites. So we all know protected area is like governed by Department of Forest and Environment, but the non-protected area is completely human dominated. So the structure, the the, the structure of vegetations, the 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 
the number of threads and the, the, the kind of threads is completely different in both protected and non-protected areas. So that I'm actually looking for, I'm, re I'm looking for to understand the potential suitable habitat of the and the major um, uh, like important attributes which actually governs to the red panda's presence in protected lands and non-protected lands and how it is differs in two different distinctive sites because it it, it actually differs because human dominated areas are like more into interaction like the species and human interactions so usually and in the protected lands uh like locals cannot uh, like, like there are many restrictions and the locals are not entering to the forest easily so only there are certain like there are certain rules regulations uh, is present in protected in non protected areas or the reserve forest areas in sikkim but not like the protected land so there are many differences i can see the many differences in my study so i have collected this sign sign surveys like some uh, direct sighting of red panda, pellets of red panda, pug marks of red panda, feeding signs of red panda, and also the other animal signs of uh, other animal signs and livestock evidences, human interactions, and any other or any other threats or natural calamities. So for vegetation structures, there are differs. Actually, there are differs in both protected and non-protected. So I have. Um, uh, I have sur uh, surveyed the the whole protected and non-protected areas to understand the overall vegetation and what is the, the dominant trees in that particular landscape, uh, the canopy, even the roosting trees. Like I have counted the roosting trees, named it, and uh, I have like I have uh, noted the probable sites in a single tree, or like I have noted the probable roosting tree sites in a single tree. So I have noted even the geographical feature in protected and non-protected in both. So the, 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 the next slide is actually, so we have found uh, red panda evidences from four different districts. Uh, that is very, like, that is really interesting. So we have covered all four districts. We, co we have uh, found uh, six different protected areas and seven different non-protected areas. And the, the major, the main interesting point is the frequent sighting is in between the 2000, 2800 to 3700 meter. So the important observation is, so the observation is actually, it's based on uh, our survey, like in protected, non-protected both. So I tried to cover all these certain points. So which is, uh, uh, the North Sikkim is highly dense red panda, like, North Sikkim has the highly dense red panda habitat, followed by the east, so sorry, west, east, and southern parts of Sikkim in respect to both protected and non-protected land. And the highest elevation was which we found in the protected, that is in uh, Singba Rhododendron Sanctuary, was 3,900 meter altitude. And the lowest elevation was which we found from uh, from Yali Reserve Forest which is non-protected area and which was i think 2500 meter sorry 400 meter so evidence was recorded mostly three different forests which is temperate broadleaf forest mixed conifer temperate forest and the alpine forest so the most of the for land basically for the in case of non-protected areas the temperate broadleaf forest covers the most area. So that is why temperate broadleaf forest, so we have recorded uh, the evidences mostly from the temperate broadleaf forest followed by this uh, mixed conifer and subalpine forest. So we have recorded 90% present signs within the 100 meter uh, water distance, both, both in protected and non-protected land. So uh, I already mentioned there are come like the threats are completely like high in the non-protected areas because the human interference is too high in non-protected areas. So starting from logging uh, and cutting the trees, livestock movements, infrastructures, human presence. So all these affects the um, like effect on this human dominated red panda site, which is mainly non-protected areas. And the variables such as the forest type, bamboo cover, disturbance, near a settlement are the relevant factors are uh, like here comparing to PA and non-PA suitability for it because this forest type uh, 
in uh, two cases are completely different because we the first, uh, like we cannot con like we cannot describe protected and non protected in a similar frame so yeah even bamboo cover is also distinctive because most of the uh, like uh, threats are present in non protected site so it it differs in some ways and quackers and rhododendron species are highly utilized by red pandas that is also like uh, by roca et al 2021 very recent paper but our observation comes up with some different spe site specific information that that actually varies on forest type dominant tree species even particular tree species which uh, available in that particular area like I, i'm i'm going to tell that there is one particular tree species which i i have found this is very new actually the species name is Osmanthus uh, sunways, which the the common name is Silinge, and this is this is uh, maybe this is a completely new. I I I I don't even found from the another paper as well. So yeah, so I have uh, I have found this particular tea in the western part, western part of Sikkim, uh, western part and the northern part of Sikkim. Sorry, do uh, like yeah, western and northern part of Sikkim. So yes, so it depends on site as well and particular tree which is found in the particular landscape. Even the seasons, seasons as well, because yeah, sometimes uh, we can say the red panda is found uh, uh, in a sorbus tree because of this sorbus fruit. So uh, in the month of like October, uh, November, they used to like we used to found red panda in sorbus tree just for the sorbus fruit. So it depends. It depends on sites, seasons, tree, like the species, like up to species, everything. So, so far, uh, many, uh, like I, I, not I actually, we are trying to cover many training programs, sensitization program. Me and my team members, like my all interns, my assistants, my associates, they are really helping me a lot because as an independent researcher, it's not possible to cover, cover up all these things, to wrap up all these things. They are helping me, even the Department of Forest and Environment, Sikkim, they are also helping me a lot. So this some some of the picture I'm sh I'm sharing uh, with you. This these are the forest official trainings before starting the field survey because they helped us in the, during the field survey. So next slide is to create to raising some awareness. So I uh, so we are trying to raise awareness with the students, local school students, college students in Sikkim. Apart from that, uh, some other other college students from out, outside of Sikkim as well. So we 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 already sensitize local people as well, like from different part of Sikkim, like wherever the red panda prior areas are there. So we uh, tr we went there and we sensitize locals. We talk with them. We uh, understand their perceptions of on this particular animal. So that was really interesting during the survey. Even uh, that is actually this picture shows in the art competition. Actually, it was uh, it was during the COVID situation. So the, we 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 all are in home, so we we couldn't do any survey that time. So we were uh, we are busy with social media page. So some interesting, uh, even uh, yes, some of them, some of the very little students, they are really interested on red pandas. So we uh, made one art competitions. We uh, like arranged one art competition on our pages so they're really interesting so I have shared this picture pictures with you so yeah so coming to the next one so I uh, like we believe the sustainable red panda ecotourism so I hope you enjoy this video this video is like uh, captured by one of my project associate Mr. Shora Mandal so he is also associated with us. Uh, he helped. He also helped me a lot during the project time. So, so yes. So I believe there's some some sustainable red panda ecotourism, which actually uh, like an essential tool to conserve the species, because uh, like in that particular area, like wherever we find red pandas, these all areas are very remote. So people are majorly like uh, like depends on the forest forest products. So if like certain uh, like if we can change us uh, like we can alter their livelihoods from forest to any certain certain uh, like uh, career or like certain yeah certain career is like the tourism. So I think that would be a like big uh, help to the wildlife conservation or red panda conservation in future. 
so the list not the last is the final slide is so what the milestone we achieved so far so we have identified the hot spots in protected and non protected land so we already even we identified the species habitat associations in, in particular protected site non protected site which actually help us in our further research uh, once we finish it we definitely uh, like build a different project which like this project actually help us to uh, co conquer the new projects so yeah we have identified bamboo different bamboo species in that particular red panda habitat we prioritized the habitat and we uh, like we 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 did research there we uh, we did some conservation awareness program uh, program over this uh, remote areas so yeah and then last one that we already trained local community like the local people there we sensitized there we sensitized the local students youth in sikkim so yeah this all the all are all we have done so far with this particular zsl edge project and the last note is like we are actually still in the final stage of our analysis and drafting so yeah hopefully we bring some finest some like good results that actually help us for the conservation especially the conservation management plan in uh, sikkim uh, especially in the non protected areas so i would like to thank you all like whoever joining me and especially i uh, uh, i like to thanks global biofest i like to thanks joe and all the supporting partners my field assistant interns all associate my professor my advisors my teammates zsl natjo society uh, wi forest department and environment department sikkim and all the associate departments thank you so much hope you like it all right uh, Mubita, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I love the video clips and I love to see all the community engagement that you had uh, with the program as well. I think that's so important. So we have time for a question or two here. And the first one is the red pandas. Are they um, elusive? Are they very difficult to spot in the wild? Yes, it's it's very difficult to spot. I already mentioned in my slide, actually, they're very shy and they're very inactive. So and especially what we can do is, you know, like once we like once I went into the survey, so sometimes we have to climb up the tree to just to like uh, to get the secondary evidences but because primary evidence is uh, like it's a bit difficult for anybody. All right. And then yeah. your research, you, you kind of mentioned where you are and what you've accomplished so far. What's your next goal? So yeah, so actually, uh, I worked with ZSL and I covered almost the distribution studies and uh, protected non protected land. I, I really want to do some seasonal occupancy, like I want to do want to know more about the species, but like what like, like does seasonal variation can affect their distributions. So yeah, like we I really want to pursue some more works, even I'm also doing my PhD as well. So yeah, I, even it is also in the end of the stage. So I'm going to submit maybe next year. All right, exciting times. Good luck with uh, the rest of your PhD. Thank you Thank for you sharing so the incredible work that you're doing uh, in Sikkim with us, with the red panda. I love that first picture on your first slide, the red panda kind of just staring into the camera. I think that was such a powerful image. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for sharing your research and starting our day, day two, a great spot to start uh, in India. Thank you so much, Jay. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, yeah. Wish you all the best for the other sp speaks. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, for India, let's take a little uh, hop over the Indian Ocean to Africa. So I'm really excited uh, for this event that we have coming up. We've got Dale Weppner joining us. He is the Assistant uh, Reserve Manager of and Beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve, which has been rehabilitated to a pristine Big Five Reserve over the last 30 years. So he works at the sharp end of conservation by protecting endangered species, gathering conservation, shaping research, keeping open communication channels with local communities, and freely sharing that knowledge and learnings for the greater good of global conservation. So let's bring Dale in with us right now. Hey, Dale, how are you doing today? Uh, good yourself, Joe. Thanks. Nice to see you all. All right. Good stuff. Well, it's great to have you joining us. 
I feel like it was just yesterday that I saw you last when we were doing our test. <laughs> um, I think you're right. Yeah, so we're we're excited to learn a little bit more about just what's happening with the conservation work at Pinda. It looks absolutely incredible. So I'm going to let you take over for a little bit. Okay, let's just get the tech stuff sorted here. Um, there we go. All right, the tech stuff is always a little adventure in itself, I think. Yep, that's for sure. All righty, let's get there. I think we're there. Are we right there? You're right there, Joe. Okay, I think we'll we'll, we'll have to try again. Um, okay. So, if you hit the share option, then pick that first option for share screen. Uh, it should ask you give you those kind of three options, and we want that entire screen. And we're going to click the little picture that uh, of your screen under entire screen, and that should light up the share button for us. Okay, share screen. Okay, little picture. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Now we're cooking. There we go. Okay, I think we're going. How does that look? Perfect. We're good. Okay. All right. That is one. Okay, well, um, good day, everyone. Um, thanks, Joe, for the introduction there. Um, yeah, I'm talking to you from uh, South Africa, from northern KwaZulu Natal, or more sort of warmly known as the heart of Zululand. Um, and I'm part of the, the Pinda conservation team and the, or the wildlife management team, if you want to put it that way. It's, a, it's quite a strategic and practical role that I, that I fulfill. Um, and along with some of the points that Joe mentioned earlier about the, the shaping research and gathering conservation, we, we're testing out a whole lot of, we're always testing out a whole lot of new ideas, um, new concepts. Um, and with it comes quite a few challenges. So that's kind of our, that, that's kind of our, our role here. Um, but yeah, very exciting, a whole lot of new stuff um, and, and some good stuff going to go. Just, um, just to intro introduce you, um, and Beyond Pinda is part of a, a much bigger, a bigger organization or company called and Beyond. Um, we've been around for about 30 years. Um, at the moment, we, we have uh, lodges and camps in uh, three different continents across the, across the globe. And you can see the little map in the middle there. We've got Southeast Asia, we've got Africa, and then we've just recently, the last few years, gone into South America as well. Um, it's basically a luxury travel company um, that also has a touring uh, touring division to it. The, um, and it's reasonably big uh, from an African point of view. We've got about just over 2,000 staff members. Um, you can see on the on the slide there are 29 different lodges and camps. Um, it's it's beyond the average lux luxury travel, and the, the idea behind it all is to create um, memorable travel experiences, but also transformational uh, travel experiences for the guests um, that come and visit these fragile places um, that our that our planet has. Um, yeah, and we have. I mean, there's a fair bit of impact that we have. We're impacting about 3,000 kilometers of coastline. Uh, 75 different communities surrounding the conservation areas that we that we operate in, um, and at the moment we we have impact over about nine million acres of land. For those on the on the different system, the, it's about 3.6 million hectares, which is fairly large um, uh, from a conservation point of view. Um, so just. You know, I just want to maybe introduce my little talk. We're just going to chat a little bit about a game reserve here. Um, it's a basically it's a 30 year undertaking so far. And the idea was to to take um, defunct and quite unproductive farmland and uh, restore it to as close to pristine wildlife habitat as it can be um, in modern times. Um, and that's been the private game reserve here. And it's now you know, over the last 30 years, this, this reserve is now a big five reserve. Um, it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of blood, sweat and tears. And at the moment, I mean, with regard in South Africa, there's been a lot of land restitution and stuff. And a lot of this reserve is actually community owned right now. Um, it's also taken a lot of work and a lot of negotiations. And it's a successful model um, that we found to be working at the moment. Um, and, you know, when I say successful model, the financial side of these models is very, very important um, in order to maintain the sustainability of it. And, and over the years, we've learned some lessons, but at the moment, things are financially su sustainable and stable. So, well, as stable as you can, 
as you can predict after COVID. But um, but yeah, so that's where we are at the moment. Um, just to introduce you a little bit to to and beyond and to Pinda as a game reserve. Um, so we'll just move on to the next slide here. Um, so he has a, an interesting statement there on the slide there. Um, it says most travel companies choose to minimize the impact, but we're not most travel companies. So in and beyond, we have basically three main concepts or three ethoses that we that drive our company, it drives our staff, it drives our guest experiences as well. Um, the first one is care of the land. Um, the second one would be care of the wildlife. And the third one would be care of the people. Um, they're not they're not important in any they're not more important than another in any different order but but they all play a very very important role in making this um the, these travel experiences sustainable and having maximum impact on these environments uh, from a in a good way and also maximum impact on the communities around the conservation areas um and then as i said before the the transformational experience for the guests that come and stay with us is important. We want to we want them to leave these natural areas, these fragile areas of our planet, um, having changed their mindsets um, to a much more sustainable way of living, or just just a bit more educated as to as to what's going on in the world, especially from a conservation point of view. Um, you know, and the guests that are the guests that come and support us, the you know the revenue generated there, it leaves our world in a better place, and it's it's just a virtuous circle. You know, the you know a lot of the the profits that are reinvested, just to give you a, a few small examples of what's happening um, within the company, we've we've reduced our our guest plastic water bottle usage by 100 percent over the last few years. So everything we try to use as little plastic as possible. I mean, just over the last over the operation of and beyond Namba Island and the Vimizi Islands off the coast of Tanzania and Mozambique. Um, we've had nearly 6,000 um, green turtles hatched there during the conservation period that we've been there. I mean, over the years, we've given over 23,000 different conservation lessons to children in neighboring communities, uh, mostly disadvantaged communities. Um, so the educational aspect is incredibly important um, from our business, business model, you know. And then, you know, some of the areas in the conservation areas are, are reasonably, let's say, um, they, they can be poor areas and access to basic sanitation and water and stuff is challenging. So, you know, as we, you know, a rough, a rough count recently, there's about 56,000 people that now have access to water and basic and decent sanitation services um, as a result of what and beyond has done in those conservation areas. Um, just to give you a... A sort of brief outline there. Um, so mo moving on to sort of a bit more of the meat of of what of what we actually want to chat about. Um, we actually want to chat about Pinder Game Reserve or Pinder Private Game Reserve. There, um, you'll see that it says the return, um, and that's very it's it's, it's quite important um, that that word the return. Um, it's the return of the wild places to areas that were previously agricultural. Um, and in you know 1991, when this this whole dream started by by people that have a, that had a vision, certain people had a great vision. This was basically a pineapple farming monoculture, and um, it wasn't particularly productive back then. Um, they had there were cattle in the areas, um, sisal. There was some game in these areas as well, uh, but mostly small game, the general kind of game that you may find on on on, on agricultural farms. Um, but certainly no large game uh, in this area at the time, besides maybe the odd uh, roaming leopard. So the founding vision was to, to rehabilitate and reintroduce all the large mammal species that had originally lived in this region. Um, and the original size of the, of the land that Pinda started as was about 32,000 acres. Uh, that was the start. That is just under half of what we are at the moment. Um, the reserve has expanded over the last few years, so so the idea is working. Um, during the agricultural period, this was a severely overgrazed and quite degraded area, quite unproductive. Um, but as you'll start to see, uh, the conservation side has really started to shine um, here in northern KwaZulu-Natal. 
Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Um, so today, as we as we stand today, um, within and beyond, Pinda is and beyond's flagship property. Um, we have uh, six award-winning luxury safari lodges on the reserve, um, delivering great guest experiences, transformational uh, guest experiences, um, and it's basically as we stand at the moment. It's a proven impact study. Um, that can be widely regarded as one of the world's sort of far-sighted and sort of successful blueprints um, for e international ecotourism. And as as we look, when we look back now, and as it is at the moment, we we are Pinda is the home to countless different species um, of animals now, from from the smallest to the largest. I mean, we've got just some examples. We've got the world's largest uh, private herd of Inyala. An antelope we found down in, 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 South, in southern Africa here. We've got thriving populations of cheetah at the moment, which was which was not the case uh, 25, 30 years ago. And there was a lot of skepticism when they were introduced. Um, we have elephant, we have rhino, we have lion. And all of those populations are of national significance uh, in South Africa. Um, and one of the reasons why these tracts of land were selected uh, back back way when 30 odd years ago is the habitat diversity in this area i mean we've got six uh, distinct different habitats on the reserve which allows for the biodiversity that you see uh, when you come here i mean we support an enormous um, population of birds insects a very well known um, population of tree species um, and, and in 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 return and in conjunction to that, you know, the animals that survive on that type of vegetation um, are quite significant. And there's a there's an interesting uh, sort of prophetic uh, meaning to the to the to the word pinda. Pinda is a is a Zulu word, um, and it actually means the return. So, if you think about what's happened, the habitat here on Pinda has returned to its original state. Um, almost to its original state after 30 years of hard and consistent and dedicated work. And the wildlife has returned to its right, rightful home. That includes some of the smaller species right up to, to elephant and rhino, black and white. Um, as I chatted about earlier, the land ownership, uh, as it is at the moment, is also being returned to its ancestral owners. Um, and those processes are still an, uh, ongoing. And... The agreements are secure, and at the moment, they look very sustainable for the future. And you know, the, the return of our guests year after year and the repeat business that we get from guests has allowed for this land to be protected and conserved. And it's basically, we all hope, going to be loved in perpetuity going forward. Um, so that's so that's where Pinda is at the moment. Uh, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail now as to what's happening on the reserve, just from a conservation point of view, um, and, and, and what we've done over the last 20 to 30 years. All right, so, I mean, we're looking at some of the animals here. These are the more spectacular species um, that you'll find on the reserve. Um, and if you want to, you can read all of that stuff uh, in, the, in the slides there. Um, you know, the dates go back to 1991, 92, 93. And maybe we to start with, um, we can chat about lion to start with. And there's a lovely picture of a nice, a nice uh, male lion just entering his prime of his life. Um, and then there's a, a nice African elephant there and a cheetah on the bottom left. And a looks like a white rhino bull on the bottom right there, a young white rhino bull. So, you know, when Pinda was started, there was none of these large mammals here. Um, it was basically just antelope species and little things like mongooses and some of the nocturnal wildlife. That was left after hunting in those days and cattle farming and stuff like that and you know for the last three decades the reserve has been meticulously and and we we trust and we hope expertly managed in order to maintain this biodiversity that we're looking for um, and to promote the conservation ethics and the conservation of these animals going forward um, the, the animal populations, it is a fenced-in reserve, as is most of the private reserves here in, in South Africa. And the animal populations 
as a result, have to be managed. And the management here is, is responsible. And there's a very, very strong focus on genetic integrity amongst all the different species that we have. I mean, anyone would know that, that animals that are confined within the fence, no matter how big it is, um, any conservationist would realize that, that eventually they're going to start inbreeding. So there's quite a lot of movement of these um, different species in and out of the reserve to, to try and allay those, um, those effects. Just to give you an idea, I mean, we're only about one-sixth of the, of the Masai Mara uh, National Reserve in Kenya, for those of you that know that place. Um, but we actually support about the same number of cheetah that they have there on a, on a much smaller uh, piece of ground. Um, and we've got, along with that, we've got very high densities of lion, uh, leopard. Hyenas are improving uh, by the day, particularly the spotted hyena. Um, and even occasionally, uh, we see the African wild dogs coming through, um, coming through the area and from different neighboring reserves. Um, they, they come and visit us from time to time. So maybe just having a look at the at a look at lion, um, you know, in 1992-93, um, 13 different lions were sourced from different prides, which is a which is a kind of a groundbreaking move. In that you know, as people would know, lions are, are family animals; they're social animals. They need to know each other to live together. But these animals were introduced, and they were introduced to each other from different prides, and it was a successful process. Um, and since then, more animal, more lion were added. But just to give you an idea, since the beginning, in 92, 93, there's been, as at, at our count at the moment, our most recent count, we've had 288 lion cubs born on this reserve. Um, and obviously, there's been natural mortality. There's been moving off to other reserves in support of other conservation initiatives with regards to lion. Um, and... You know, what is what is noteworthy in that statement is that the lion population on Pinda is second to the Kruger National Park from a genetic uh, diversity point of view, which for us is very, very important. Um, lions, if they do start inbreeding, can have, there can be negative effects on the population, as with many different species. Um, so it's an important uh, aspect to pay attention to. So... You know, we've and also we've run, we've introduced lions to other uh, countries as well, uh, particularly Rwanda, um, and that was to try and alleviate, uh, well, not alleviate, to to reintroduce lions into Rwanda after 15 years of local uh, extinction, after the 1994 genocide, the lion populations, particularly in Akagera National Park. Uh, took a major hammering and uh, a lot of animals were were poisoned by cattle herders and stuff for a lot of the lions but uh, and beyond pinda took took part in reintroducing lions into uh, akagera and at the moment they have a population of 36 lions uh, in rwanda in akagera and so that's been a successful reintroduction of a large predator uh, across borders into an, another African reserve. Um, so we can, I mean, we can have a look at uh, cheetah, uh, the next one there. The, the initial population of cheetah that was introduced into Pinda came from, from Namibia because cheetah at the time um, were not easily available in South Africa. I um, mean, you can see there were 12 in two different groups. Um, and, you know, we... We, we wide, Pinda nowadays is widely regarded as one of the, having one of the most important uh, genetically diverse and predator savvy cheetah uh, within the private fenced reserves in Southern Africa. And even taking into consider some of the national parks as well. Our cheetah population has done exceptionally well. Um, and when we talk about uh, uh, predator savvy, that's very, very important because they are vulnerable to, to being uh, killed by some of the other bigger predators, including lion, leopard, sometimes even spotted hyena. Um, so when cheetah were introduced into Pinda, it was done before the introduction of lions. So the cheetahs could establish their, their home ranges, um, get their territory sorted out, get to know their environment, and start working on this predator savviness that we talk about. Um, 
before the Lions were introduced. So it gave them a little bit of a, a helping hand in getting themselves established. So um, as a result of that, um, as we stand at the moment, uh, just to give you some, some, stats, some stats on the cheetah here at Pinder, we've had 63 different litters born and possibly even a few more that you may not have seen. Um, and that's equating to very close to or just above 200 different cheetah cubs born here on Pinder um, over the last uh, 25, 30 years. That's, I think in anyone's book, you could, you could look at that and see that's a successful reintroduction project. And the important part about that is not so much as that we can sustain cheetah here, is that we can then move these genetically diverse cheetah because they came from Namibia and are not, they were not particularly um, linked to the meta population in South Africa. We can then move these cheetah to other reserves and, and start new populations um, within South Africa. And even internationally, we've moved uh, some cheetah to, to Malawi, to Lawandi. And it was the start of a population there as well. A, a dominant breeding male was moved from Pinda to Malawi. And he has since mated with females there, and they have had cubs, successful successful raising of those cubs. So, so the cheetah population, even though if a, uh, if you came to Pinda, you would look at the environment, and it's not quite the same as the Serengeti or the Masai Mara, is where the you know the the what you would think of cheetah living in that type of habitat. Our habitat here is quite thick, it's quite dense, um, but the cheetah have done exceptionally well here. Um, and breeding prolifically, as long as they don't come into contact with too many lions. But they they seem to be pretty savvy at the moment, and they seem to be managing. Alrighty, so um, talking about elephants, elephants is always an iconic species to have on a big five reserve. I mean, it, you, you're, not a, you're not much of a big game reserve if you haven't got an elephant, or a couple of elephants. Um, and elephants, the introduction of elephants also started around 1991, and that was, and that was also a... a in a way, controversial, groundbreaking introduction of elephants into a game reserve where 37 orphan youngsters were relocated onto the reserve. And they were basically the orphans from the old culling programs, the National Parks culling programs. Um, and if you had read any of the documentation, those animals were sometimes slightly, slightly traumatized, not really socially adapted to each other. But they were introduced to Pinda. And they started to form their little social groups and their herds. Not, not too long after that, uh, four adult animals were introduced from Zimbabwe in 1993. And that started creating a much more stable social platform for the elephant families and the matriarchal development, the development of the dominant bulls in the area. Um, and started stabilizing the elephant populations quite nicely. So by 1995, the first calf, uh, was born on Pinda, um, conceived on Pinda, and uh, born on Pinda. And, you know, the elephant herd at the moment is breeding so well that uh, occasionally the females get contracepted, uh, which is a accepted practice in um, game reserves here in South Africa, particularly fenced in game reserves. And um, it's a non-invasive process, and uh, it just helps to control the growth rate of the population, which if left unchecked, can easily outgrow the ability of the habitat to support them. So, you know, from initial 37 animals, you know, our last count, which was pretty recently, we're sitting at 121 different uh, elephant here on the reserve. And um, amongst that are some quite uh, noteworthy animals, uh, which we can discuss a little bit as well just now. With regards to rhino, uh, that's also a very, very important species, uh, white and black rhino. Um, that bottom picture there, the, um, the bottom right-hand side, there's a white rhino. You can see by the square lip there. Um, the initial introduction of rhino into Pinda was also in the early 90s, and 21 rhino were introduced uh, into the reserve from a neighboring reserve. Um, at the time, it was the largest relocation of rhino um, to, to a game reserve. Um, and they were mainly white rhino. Um, and a significant development in 2004 was Pinta being selected to be part of the, the WWF Isambelo KwaZulu Natal Wildlife Black Rhino Range Expansion Project. Some, some of you might know it as the BREP project, um, where we 
received an initial um, amount of 15 black rhino, uh, a population of 15 animals. Those animals have since significantly, significantly increased in number to the point now where the reserve is, is of the ability to release those animals to start up other populations in other reserves. Um, the white rhino population <laughs> from, you know, from the initial 21 has grown to, to hundreds. Uh, we, we can't give out the details completely as everyone's aware of the, the rhino situation in, in South, South and Southern Africa. Um, but, but both populations have bred exceptionally well. They've adapted to the habitats here. And um, yes, so uh, that's also uh, a great milestone for this reserve, you know, from a reintroduction point of view. Okay, so, you know, that was the early years and until sort of where we've got to now. Let's move on to the next one. So just from an elephant point of view, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide there, um, or let's look at the top left-hand side, there's a very big elephant bull that's been immobilized there, um, ready for translocation. And just recently, um, we introduced some very large Tuskers elephant bulls um, from Tembe uh, Game Reserve, which is just near the Mozambican border, just north of us. It's one of the large, or the, one of the last populations of large elephant tuskers, elephant bulls tuskers, uh, left in Africa, and um, the idea behind it was we, we were very fortunate to be able to secure these animals. We introduced two large tuskers, and um, the idea behind it was to spread that genetic uh, population a little bit, and also from an ecotourism point of view, it's a fantastic thing to see one of the last, um, well, not one of the last, but but one of the large tuskers. Uh, in Africa, in KwaZulu Natal, you know, not everyone goes to Tembi, but we get a lot of international uh, guest traffic here at Pinda. So to be able to see some of these elephants uh, is, is quite special. Um, there's also some pictures of some creatures on the right hand side there. Some of you will recognize them as being pangolins. Um, we we've partnered with the African work, pangolin working group in recent years, over the last few years, and we've been reintroducing pangolins into Pinda that have been captured uh, from the illegal trade of pangolins. And it's one of the most trafficked animals in the world. Um, they, they often get seized in sting operations um, and then go to the Johannesburg uh, Wildlife Veterinary um, Institution. And there they get treated for, for any dehydration, malnutrition, or any conditions they may have developed while being in captivity or being in the illegal trade. Some of the, you know, the the, the, the conditions that they live in are horrific um, prior to being poached or, or prior to being uh, sold. And um, so, these, so these pangolins, if they, don't, if they can't be traced to their original origins and put back into their, to their original areas that they roamed in, are introduced into Pinda. There's a soft release process that we take part in. And um, yes, it's also been once more, a very successful project. We've had over 15 pangolins introduced into Pinda. They're starting to become wild now in that the fact that we don't have to track them all the time and monitor them. So the population itself is starting to establish itself here, as well as us having two births of young pangolins, which we believe were conceived here on the reserve. So that's a very exciting project that's been going on here uh, for the last few years. Um, a lot of field work, a lot of uh, long hours, a lot of challenging environments, but these scaly creatures are getting a foothold here in northern KwaZulu Natal after being absent from this environment for at least between 40 and 50 years. Um, and also, you know, going back to elephants again, uh, we've subsequently brought in four young young elephant bulls from Tembi as well to add to the genetic makeup here on Pinda, as well as a small breeding herd of eight animals. So. We have, we have great hopes for expanding that genetic population from Tembi, which was quite isolated um, due to the natural migratory corridors of elephants being broken up by human settlements. Um, and we're looking forward to the future growth of those herds and seeing some more tuskers in this area as well. I mean, other animals that we're also introducing just recently, we've got black and white, black and side striped jackals that we're introducing periodically from time to time. Um, bushback clip springers from an antelope point of view. So the process is continuing. We haven't stopped, and uh, we're going to continue going forward. All righty, so let's move on to another one here. Um, just going back to lions a little bit. 
The when we spoke about Akagira uh, mm. a little while ago um, about lions, you know, sadly the big cats there had become locally extinct about 15 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, um, following the, the genocide. And um, we took part in relocating some of the breeding females back into Akagira. And um, it's been, once again, a successful breeding project for them. They've, they have tourists and uh, guests coming to visit those lions there and having regular sightings of those lions. We, we also know from feedback that they have bred. And so there are cubs in the area. And so that, um, that lion population is, is, is also taking off, which is, uh, which is, which is brings, you know, it's, it's heartwarming to all of us, you know, as, as human expansion uh, carries on, um, the habitat for lion and big predators becoming shrinking is shrinking by the day. And um, to be able to introduce these animals into, into habitat where they can survive and be protected is a, is a, great, uh, is a great step forward. And we've also helped to introduce lion population into Mozambique. There were 11 animals that went to one of the conservation areas in Mozambique a few years ago. Also in, in other Southern African reserves in Eastern Cape, uh, other reserves in KwaZulu-Natal, Pumalanga area, the Northwest and Vipopo, all different provinces. We've been moving lions around from a genetic diversity point of view as, as much as we can. Um, and it's, and it, they're in demand from Pinda because of the genetic, because of the genetic diversity. Um, so, so just give a little bit of a brief, um, a brief chat about the lions uh, that that are here on the reserve. Um, righty, so let's move on to the. We've got back to gone back to cheetah a little bit. Um, you can read for yourselves there. There's only about seven thousand one hundred cheetah left. Uh, at our cheetah left in the wild, um, you know, eighty nine percent of their natural historic range has been lost due to human encroachment and habitat habitat loss, but. As we chatted about earlier, um, we've had over 200, 200 uh, different cubs uh, or 200, 200 cubs born here on the reserve. Uh, most have survived. Some have uh, fallen prey to other predators, which is a natural process. Um, but in the, but in 2017, the Endangered Wildlife Trust, Trust uh, expanded its borders for the first time, and we introduced cheetah into uh, Lewandi, like we chatted about earlier. And there was a, a a, a virile and very productive male that went that way and he seems to be doing very well up there and um, so since 2011 um because initially the cheetah population and pinda had to establish itself and start breeding properly but since 2011 57 different cheetah have been introduced into new reserves um in south africa mostly or southern africa um and that and that and that has aided in in ecotourism, but also aided in the genetic dispersal of the of the, of the of the animals from Pinda here to new places. Uh, all right. So and then we're going to go back to Rwanda there a little bit there. This is a recent project that and Beyond Pinda took part in in um, collaboration with the Rwandan Development Board and African Parks Parks, and funded by um, the Howard Buffett Foundation. Um, so once again, uh, Pinda has come full circle here, and we're reintroducing a rhino into local extinct areas um, in Africa. And this was a, a collaboration, a project, a partnership that took place um, back to, uh, to to send rhino back into Rwanda. Um, and as far as we know, it was the largest. Uh, translocation of rhino ever attempted um, where 30 rhino uh, 30 breeding uh, animals left uh, in the game reserve and headed for Rwanda um, and you know that was a that that was a real privilege to be part of an operation like that um, to be able to be able to send these animals to Akagira and to get the feedback from Akagira um, about how well they're doing there, how well they've adapted to the environment. And the fact that we've had calves born, or they've, Akagira in, in, in Rwanda, has had calves born uh, since the introduction of these animals just, just a year ago. So, you know, to be part of that, it's a great privilege to be part of a move like that. It's, a, it's an incredible amount of logistics, incredible amount of planning, an incredible amount of preparation, um, quarantining animals, getting customs clearances, veterinary permits to get animals out of the country. 
and to just hear that they've been established in a new game reserve um, or not a new game reserve, but a new population in the game reserve and that they are breeding successfully is um is, is, is really something to be well we feel that well, i feel it's part of being proud to be part of you know um that i mean just from a logistics point of view there had to be incredible efficiencies involved there from an animal welfare point of view from just to give an idea it, uh, from when the first animal was immobilized for the transportation from south africa to rwanda they were released into their their release moments in Ekagira in just under 48 hours that involves all of the immobilizations loading into transport crates onto trucks traveling to international airports clearing customs veterinary permits loading onto aircraft um, a, a very large aircraft was used um, loading all of the animals at one time onto an aircraft takes hours and um, then the flight up there the offloading of the aircraft back onto trucks to the capture biomas again for release um, those animals were grumpy and uh, that can be understandable but they've adapted and they've all survived and that's been a great success uh, from a rhino relocation uh, project um all right so okay so let's let's move on to the next one here um just an idea of of, of what uh, just where where and beyond wants to go in the future we we're looking at uh scaling up and that those that's in the vision from just under nine million acres we want to scale up to about having 50 million acres of impact in the environment and um, the broad scaling impact vision is to have at least by 2030 25 million acres of uh, land under direct and beyond management from a conservation point of view and from a community development point of view um, and then at least another 25 million acres um, influenced by our impact coalitions uh, whether it's communities or um, partnerships with other conservation organizations um, and that we're hoping to have have ha have had done by 2030 as a goal um, and you know once again empowering and creating shared values with the surrounding communities is very important to us uh, from a conservation point of view and going back to financial models i mean these this type of expansion obviously takes money um, and we're looking at doubling the revenue generated by the company um, and tripling profits by managing the business more efficiently and anyone that just went through COVID, especially from a, from a tourism point of view um, has realized that uh, efficient business is is just a no-brainer uh, cost cutting and and clever decision making has to be made to in order to keep these businesses floating and uh, sustainable um, so we're looking to continue delivering those extraordinary guest experiences those transformational experiences and changing the way people look at the world you know and you know we don't want to cost the earth uh, from an impact point of view we actually want to impact in a positive way and um, do as little destructive impact as humans are are very prone to be doing as possible um, so that's just a very a very quick sort of overview a very quick look at uh, at what is happening here at and beyond Pinda private game reserve yeah, in northern KwaZulu Natal, and um, yeah, thank you all for for listening. For those that did, and um, we are on social media. We are on the net. You can go to www.andbeyond.com. We have an impact review, which is a very interesting read, um, and um, we also have an informative podcast called "Leave Our World a Better Place" that you're welcome to listen to when you can. Um, I think that that about wraps up what uh, what I was going to say, and um, I'm open to questions. If anyone would like to have any questions, and I'll answer them the best I can. All right. Well, Dale, thank you for that awesome presentation. the The scale of the work uh, that Pinda is doing is just just amazing, and those examples of those reintroductions you. And the success, uh, that you and the team have been having are are, are just first class. That's absolutely amazing. So, Dale. What led you to conservation in the first place? Well, you know, it's, it's uh, having having grown up uh, on a farm and uh, in a sort of rural environment. You just you realize very early in your life that 
uh, if we can't look after our world and if we can't leave it a better place, um, what are we actually achieving? You know, we, the, the resources on this planet are finite. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's a, it's a drive inside you if, you, if you're that way inclined, is to get into conservation and, you know, you know re, rehabilitate these habitats, reintroduce, reintroduce these animals and um, just make a difference where you can. And if everyone just makes a little bit of difference, um, we're definitely going in the right direction. Yeah, I can imagine the job of a conservation is ups and downs, <laughs> really high moments, and then yeah, really low moments too. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very true statement. We have we have um, some really really heartwarming moments and some real um, some real successes, um, but then you also have your challenges, and those challenges we've just got to take. You know, we've got to. Take them, take them straight on the shoulder, and then wake up another day just to just to carry on, you know. Um, but but overall, it's a very very fulfilling um, uh, type of work to be doing, and it's it's, it's a real real privilege to be in this uh, be in this industry. Yeah, and then you know you you, you mentioned so many components uh, of of this protection and what it does. Uh, for the community, I imagine you probably employ a lot from the community as well. Yes, now, most in, in pretty much all of and beyond's operations, and particularly around Pinda here, we've got very strong relationship with the local communities. There's five communities uh, surrounding the reserve, um, and there's constant dialogue between the different communities and the management of the reserve and the executive management of the company. Um, so you know, more than more than 80% of the staff that we have working here on the reserve come from these local communities. Um, and that, I mean, that ranges from skilled uh, skilled workers to unskilled labor, um, which is also very, very important. Um, and that's making a huge impact in just keeping these families going outside. Often these areas are quite impoverished. Um, resources are very limited. Um, it can be that, you know, a single breadwinner can be supporting up to 20 others in the family. So you know that's it's, it's one of the, it's one of the objectives of, of employment in, the, in these areas. You know? All right. Well, Dale, uh, I'm going to share the link one more time here, uh, nbeyond.com, to dive in yeah. more, find out that's more it. about uh, not only Pinda but the network around the world, which is pretty unique. Uh, mm -hmm. And I mean, Dale, the, the work is going so successful right now. A huge goal of 25 million, then 50 million. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, big. Yeah. Influence. I mean, wow. That's that's judging by what's been done so far. I, I think uh, I think you've got a good shot at it. No, thanks very much. It, uh, it's a it's a challenge. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but if it's you know, if we can just keep everything sustainable and we keep changing those hearts and minds about what we're doing in the world, um, I think those goals can be reached. It's uh, it's definitely an achievable uh, target. All right. Well, Dale, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for your team behind the scenes who helped make this possible. And uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day and an awesome uh, World Biodiversity Day tomorrow. Yeah. No, thanks very much. Thank you, Joe, for all your help. And uh, thank you to all that have listened. And hope you've made a difference. Good. Thanks. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Dale. We'll see you later. All right. Well, uh, we're going to continue with with our theme, our visit on the African continent right now and move to Tanzania. And I've been looking forward to this presentation for a while. We have a great group of speakers to give us kind of a showcase of what what really is an incredible program. So the team in African people and wildlife envision a world where Africa's people and wildlife coexist and thrive in vibrant, healthy landscapes. They work to protect wildlife, invest in people and restore balance. Uh, to wildlife and the diverse ecosystems they call home. So together with communities and other partners, they focus on priorities that deliver win-win sustainable solutions for people uh, and nature, focusing on wildlife conservation and coexistence, natural resource stewardship, landscape restoration, sustainable livelihoods, and strategic partnerships. We're going to hear from six members of the team today, and I'm going to bring in the first member here with um, us right now. So Neovitis uh, Sienga is joining us today. He is the Community Conservation and Environment Program Officer at African People and Wildlife. He has a long history of family involvement in conservation, believing uh, Tanzania has a strong future in conservation of its environments as long as rural communities are empowered to manage their natural resources wisely. So I'm going to bring him in live with us right now. Here we go. Neovitis, how are you doing today? 
I'm great, Joe. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. It's so great to see you. It's so great to have you joining us live today. It's so great to see you too. Excellent. Well, look, we, we, we've had a great start to the morning. We're in India. We're now moving through Africa a little bit and visiting a few countries to hear about the conservation work and stories. So if you're up for it, let's let you take over for a little bit. Let's let's hear a little bit from you. Perfect. So, yeah, um, as you introduced me, my name is Neovita Sianga, and I work for African People in Wildlife as a community conservation and environment program officer. Uh, and today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the work that we do, our approach, our holistic approach, and uh, the work that we do to uh, create a win-win solution between uh, people and, and nature. So uh, to begin with, um, African People and Wildlife was founded in 2005 uh, with an aim of helping rural communities to manage and benefit from uh, the resources that, that are surrounding them. Uh, it's a, a, basically a field-based organization here in Tanzania that is located at the edge of Tarangire National Park, a very beautiful park with uh, a lot of wildlife. Uh, so generally where we work with communities and we are located uh, where the communities are and we consider ourselves to be community members working with communities. Um, we work with over 80 uh, communities uh, through different landscapes uh, from Tarangire where we are, we are located up uh, north in Lake Natron where we have just begun uh, a new project to, together with WWF Tanzania. Uh, and we also work with uh, different NGOs, uh, uh, government entities, uh, for example, the Tanz Tanzania National Park Authority, the Ngorongoro Conservation Area Authority, uh, among others. Um, our holistic approach uh, is uh, basically uh, includes uh, three main things where the people are at the center uh, of uh, everything that we do and uh, we take them to be the catalysts of uh, change. Um, in that, we also have the wildlife where we, we contribute in making sure that they are, they are increasing but also have a help, help they also help uh, the ecosystem. But also, we also on top of it, we have water, which are natural, natural resources. Uh, we try to ensure that they are shared equitably between the people and the wildlife. So, uh, looking uh, at Joe, yes, I'm sorry to jump in and, and uh, interrupt your flow, but I'm just noticing that the screen share, it just has a okay. bar in front of it um, about your Dropbox. Can you just hit close on the, there we go. That's better, perfect. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, where we have, uh, again, uh, land and water are the natural resources that you know pe both people and wildlife do share, and we ensure that all these uh, natural resources are shared equitably. Uh, looking at our core strategies uh, for the holistic conservation program that we, we have, uh, on top of it, we, we, we do uh, strengthen natural resource stewardship, where we have uh, both youth uh, educational programs, adult programs um, that, you know, we help train community members on how best to manage their natural resources, but also benefit from the natural resources that are surrounding them. Um, another um, uh, core of what we do is uh, developing conservation enterprise. Uh, basically, we work with women to uh, ensure that uh, they get benefit from the resources that are surrounding them, including the beekeeping uh, program. And then I'll be talking more of uh, conserving the wildlife and pro promoting existence with our flagship program, which is the Human Wildlife Conflict uh, Prevention Program, and uh, also uh, restoring and connecting landscape with our uh, climate change program, uh, under which we do uh, have the Sustainable Rangeland Initiative. Uh, but also we, we, we do uh, build strategic partnership with different organizations, uh, both non-governmental and governmental organizations. Um, with uh, the Human Wildlife Conflict Program, which is our flagship program, uh, basically we work with over uh, um, 80 communities, as I said, and uh, almost 95% of these communities are pastoralists. And they stay uh, with wildlife. So basically, we work with areas that are outside protected areas. But also, for example, the Ngorongoro Conservation Area is an area that do have uh, people and wildlife in it. Uh, 
Obviously, there will be conflicts that uh, will occur in these areas between people and wildlife. And what we do is uh, we sat down with communities to uh, co-design and co-implement a human wildlife conflict uh, mitigation program, whereby uh, communities by themselves uh, do gather information, do follow up on conflicts that are happening, and then we help them uh, to uh, come up with solutions that will help uh, mitigate or reduce human wildlife conflict. Um, together with communities, we came up with a pro uh, program called the Living World Program, which is uh, a program that uh, we, we, together with the communities, build up uh, predator-proof corrals, uh, which we refer to as Living World, to uh, reduce human wildlife conflicts uh, at uh, uh, the homesteads. Um, up to now, as we speak, uh, we have uh, constructed over 1,500 uh, predator-proof corrals in uh, communities that, you know, keep uh, the livestock of uh, pastoralists at night safe, while also the predators are enjoying their landscapes outside. So it's, again, a win-win situation between uh, uh, communities, but also uh, the wildlife that is found around. Um, we, uh, as I said, we work with uh, over five landscapes in Tanzania, six landscapes in Tanzania, and this is just one of the landscapes that we work with, which is West Kilimanjaro, where we also set up these predator-proof uh, corrals. Um, together also with communities, uh, we have uh, what we call World Warriors of Wildlife, who uh, basically do uh, track wildlife. Uh, they go out to see where actually the wildlife are, so that they can uh, help on uh, mitigate or reduce conflicts or respond also to conflicts that are happening down uh, at uh, their communities. Uh, these warriors of our lives are community members from uh, the different communities that we work with. Uh, they understand the different dynamics of the landscape, but also the different wildlife that are uh, in those areas. Um, this has really helped uh, to, again, uh, find the balance between communities and also nature that uh, is surrounding them. I'd also like to talk about uh, our other program, which is uh, the Climate Change Mitigation Program, under which uh, we have the Sustainable Rangeland Initiative. In this, we partner together with communities uh, to uh, monitor their grazing areas and manage their grazing areas for uh, uh, the better the betterment of their livestock, but also uh, the wildlife that is uh, surrounding them. We do this uh, through uh, regular data collection uh, assessment, which I'm sure my fellow colleagues uh, Liz and Rama will talk more about this, and also active management for improved pasture for both uh, the people and the livestock. Uh, together with this, uh, we implement with the communities uh, small projects uh, that will revitalize the quality of uh, their grazing areas uh, so that uh, these landscapes can both benefit uh, the people and the wildlife. So we have projects like uh, invasive species removal. Uh, we have uh, projects like uh, uh, rehabilitating uh, degraded lands, uh, among other projects like water projects uh, to help communities uh, to access and get uh, quality pastures, but also uh, quality water and other resources that are found around uh, rangelands. Uh, we don't do this alone, as I said uh, at first. We also do this with other um, partners, including non-governmental organizations, as I said, but also we do with uh, government aid agencies, as I said uh, before, uh, like the TANAPA, TANAP, Tanzania uh, National Parks Authority, and the Gorongoro Conservation Areas. Um, to look more on what we do, uh, you can go through our websites, our social media is indicated uh, there. Uh, thank you very much, Joe. All right, awesome. So I popped that website up there on the screen as well, africanwildlife.org. Uh, and Neovitis, what, I mean, the list of projects is pretty impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think what's so important is so much emphasis is placed on the community and making sure the commu community has sustainability and a livelihood because in turn, that turns around and that helps with the conservation, helps protect those wild places and those, those wild species. Yeah. 
So in the intro that I had for you, uh, you know, it, it was mentioned that that your family has a long history in, in, in conservation. Do you want to touch on that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, so um, I come from a conservation family uh, from uh, my uh, grandfather, who was uh, actually the first uh, forest guard of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro National Park uh, when it was established uh, in, uh, in the, uh, back in the days. And uh, in fact, he was awarded uh, by Queen Elizabeth as one of the uh, first forest guards in, uh, in Tanzania in 1953. And then uh, my dad is also a, a, a forester in that line of conservation too. And uh, yeah, I'm here also uh, become, become, becoming uh, another uh, conservation hero in the family. In fact, uh, I was awarded by Disney, uh, a Disney conservation hero uh, award in uh, 2019. Oh, amazing. Carrying on an incredible legacy uh, of conservation and well-recognized, uh, Neovitis. That's amazing projects, amazing work. Um, and I'm excited to meet some more of the team. You've, you've got an incredible team behind you, which I'm sure helps a lot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the team, the team is really big. Uh, uh, and again, uh, almost 98% of the team are Tanzanians and local uh, community members that we work with. Uh, across uh, Tanzania. So uh, uh, I'm sure we will be joined by uh, Ramadan, uh, Priska and Liz uh, to present more about some of the work that we do at uh, APW. Absolutely. Well, Neovitis, thank you so much. I'm gonna tuck you backstage for now. I'm, I'm gonna bring in our next uh, member of the team to, to share a little bit with us. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, we are now going to bring in Elizabeth Naro. She is the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, Adaptation, and Learning for African People and Wildlife. Uh, Liz oversees data collection and conducts analysis uh, of all program monitoring data, including uh, making sure it's accurate and correct. So I'm going to bring her in live with us right now. Hey, Liz, how are you? Hi, Joe. How are you? Thanks. Good, good. I love your background, a nice green background today. <laughs> Difficult to find. I'm in the in the city of Arusha right now, actually, but was able to find a decent, quiet place. Um, I'm going to share my screen if you guys don't mind. Absolutely. Let's get it queued up, and I'll let you know when it uh, when it comes in. All right, here it comes, and we are in business. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, as Joe said, my name is Elizabeth Nero. I'm the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, Learning, and Adaptation for African People and Wildlife. I'm American, uh, but have been living here in Tanzania for about four years. Uh, and have really fallen in love with this country and its beautiful wild places, as well as the people and, and the cultures here. Um, as the head of monitoring, evaluation, learning, and adaptation, most of what I focus on is data collection, <clears throat> ensuring that the protocols are accurate uh, for multiple different programs, um, as well as the analysis of that uh, data afterwards and the visualization, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So we conduct data analysis and data collection on several of the programs that my colleague Novitis discussed earlier, um, from human wildlife conflict to rangeland monitoring um, to some of our enterprise programs uh, that will be touched on even later in the presentation. Um, but to start, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, our GIS specialist, Ramadani Saidi, who's going to discuss a little bit more with you about a, spe a special project that he's been working on with um, youth actually, and the introduction of GIS and other technological tools to get you science and data collection. Um, so if, uh, if Joe, you could bring Ramadani here into the, onto the stage, I would love to have him give a little bit more discussion about our youth programming. All right, Ramadani is in. How you doing, Ramadani? Hello, hi. Um... My name is Ramadan Saidi, as um, Liz introduced me earlier there, um, the J specialist. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about um, this youth programming, um, the citizen science, and stuff like that. Um, so 
uh, my colleague Neil, Neil Vitas uh, started talking about the programs that uh, as the African people in wildlife has, and one of them being um, youth uh, education program. In youth education program, um, we have this uh, citizen science, and this is this is one of the of the new projects that I started working with, and and uh, in youth. In youth education program, um, they have environmental clubs that they like. They are target groups. In those environmental clubs, then they are, we use those environmental clubs to to practice or to have this um, citizen science. So we have like uh, thirteen primary school primary schools and six secondary schools, um, and these are the are the schools that the, 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 we, we have a program, youth education program. So in those environmental clubs, those members then, we, me and, uh, me and youth education program members, all, 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 all staff, we, we went to introduce um, the GIS, the GIS concept in general, uh, the data collection, because these this students, according to the level of understanding and the significance and the complicity of the technology that we wanna, we wanna introduce to these kids, we decided to, to go with secondary school, which we have 60 secondary schools. And the, um, the goal being, uh, being to, 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 to create uh, that awareness and build that passion for science. So uh, we went to those six secondary schools to give them some introduction of JS and some sources of data. Uh, like you can see there, we, we use that map, like a local map showing their villages, there's where they, their schools are located on that map just to get the sense of um, the concept of GIS. And uh, talking a little bit about uh, ArcGIS Online, which is, um, which is the platform that we're going to, to analyze the data that these kids they are going to, to to collect, and as you can see from that picture, uh, that's all the um, gadgets GPS. Uh, we instructed them like how to get this um, to to get the how can we map the locations, how can we get those coordinates by using that device there, and getting that um, general concept about GIS, uh, ArcGIS Online, and Survey One Two Three, which is a uh, the mobile um, data collection app, uh, which is we use to uh, when you have like when they do they, they do have like a method we, we teach them a different methodologies, but you know when you have like a questionnaires and you want to like conduct your survey, we talked about how we can we can we can create some forms um, using the questionnaire that they have developed, um, collaborating with their teachers and together with um with the department and the African, African people and wildlife. As you can see, these kids, they're just instructing themselves. This, uh, that picture shows they were um, doing some pilot studies, uh, pilot um, surveys, like to how to collect data using their um, uh, different topics that they selected themselves. Because we, we tried to like, um, talk, we, we consulted their teacher and type of topics that they teach uh, we, 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 like, um, we advise them, like, uh, topics that are relating to the, to the work or activities that TPW or African People in Wildlife are doing. And then um, they generate questionnaires, and I help them with uh, creating forms that I can, you can use them in survey one to three. And uh, so far, they, they were really, really, really excited about the project of citizen science because they get the chance to, like, practice and get the experience and, and, and even their knowledge to, to, to broaden their knowledge on, on about science because there are different topics that they selected like climate change, invasive species, rangelands and, and stuff like that. So uh, we use tablets, uh, we use tablets like uh, for just um, a good display, to have a good interface for every kid to see and, and to read uh, those uh, questions that they have to like to run their, their researches. Um, yeah, as you, as you can see there, 
yes, they, they, they are using those tablets. And right now, they're in the process of data, data collection. As, as, as citizen science is simply um, involved in this uh, amateur scientist is in, in, in the part of, of researchers and, and that's how they are doing right now. They're doing that data collection and we're gonna help them analyze using uh, um, some, some cool tools and, and, and application and act just online uh, to, to come and give them the, um, the findings for those uh, researches or surveys that they, they they are conducting right now. Yeah, so uh, that's all. And thank you guys for listening. And I welcome my um, my colleague, Elizabeth, to continue finishing the rest of the, of the slides. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Rama. Um, so as, as Ramadani was saying, uh, we focus a lot on engaging the youth in citizen science tools and using these technological tools. But we also have a whole suite of programs that focus on adult-based um, data collection. So I'm going to share with you now um, a bit of data collection and the results of that, the visualization of that data from our human wildlife conflict program. So as Neil Vitus mentioned earlier, we have a team of about 95 wild uh, warriors for wildlife that are field-based community members that have been trained to collect data about conflict that happens between predators and livestock. It's a very common issue in the Maasai communities that are primarily pastoralist, where their livestock are um, eaten or attacked by predators like lions or hyenas or leopards. So these officers go into the field with the same tools that the youth are using. So they're very simple tools to use. Um, and I'd like to show you now some of the results of that data that we collect. If it will let me share my screen again. Let me know, Liz, if you get any strange messages and, and we can try and walk through it. I think it was oh. just taking a minute to catch up. So I'm looking at my own face here. All <laughs> right. Can you all see a dashboard now? Yeah, it looks good. Great. OK, so this is an example of our human wildlife conflict dashboard. As Ramadani just said, we collect all of this data in the field using this, the GIS, ArcGIS application survey one, two, three which allows us to customize the tools to collect data on any topic, like Ramadani said, from youth-based topics about um, climate change or invasive species to something like this, which is on human wildlife conflict. Um, that data are embedded then into this dashboard and updated in real time. So this is something that we have found to be so useful internally because rather than having to analyze the data in you know, for instance, an Excel sheet or a Google sheet, and then create uh, features, you know, like a pie chart or like a graph from there, these dashboards update the data in real time. We can also use the dashboards then to make decisions about our programming moving forward. So for instance, this dashboard shows that since we started collecting data on this, which was way back in 2013, we have collected or responded to over 4,000 conflicts between predators and livestock. Um, here in this pie chart, you can see the predator that is responsible for most conflict in its Swahili name, Fisi. But if you know what that is, it's hyena. Hyena are responsible for almost 72% of all conflict between people and, or between livestock and carnivores, um, with leopard here, the next largest uh, predator that is responsible for conflict at only about 12% and here lion at only about 7%. Um, so this does give us a sense of where to focus on what types of species to focus on and what to work on with communities and particularly pastoralists in their herding practices to keep their livestock safer. We also collect a very important piece of data here on whether that conflict occurred out at the pasture, or in Swahili Malishoni, or at the boma or cattle corral, that's at the homestead. You'll notice it's pretty close, it's about 50-50, but 
we focus on one of our particular programs that Neovitis talked about, Living Walls, Protect Livestock at the BOMA. So we can use a dashboard like this and sort it specifically to BOMA conflict. If we select one piece, the entire dashboard works, will sort by BOMA conflict. And we'll get a couple of pieces of information by doing this. One, we see that feces or hyena are even more of a significant issue when you're focusing on BOMA conflict specifically at over 82%. We also notice that Simba or lion are much less, much less of a problem at the homestead than they are, for instance, out at pasture. Now this bar graph at the bottom has the type of conflict and it's separated out by district. So we work in four different districts in this program right now. And as I said, our living walls program that Neovitis discussed earlier specifically targets reducing conflict at the BOMA or at the homestead by installing chain link fence around um, trees that are, are planted, living trees that are planted. So by looking at a dashboard like this, we can identify the hot spots of BOMA conflict and target the living walls program at priority areas where the installation of those living walls will have the greatest impact. For instance, if you look down here at this graph again, or at this chart again, you'll notice that Babati district has a much higher percentage of BOMA conflict than it does pasture conflict. So we know that Babati district is an area where we should focus intensely on building living walls. Now, if that's not enough of a, of a way to convince you, we have another great tool that we've used from our data using a map like this, which shows each one of the points of, a, of an incident of conflict that's collected with the colors representing different species. And here in this graph, or here in this map, you see each individual point, but since there's so many, again, almost over 4,000 points here, it's impossible to identify hotspots just by looking at the map. But with a quick and simple ArcGIS tool like this, we can simply drag a slider over, and the map itself identifies the hot spots of conflict. Now here in Babati district, which came up as a hot spot of BOMA conflict on the dashboard, we also notice is like a deep yellow color here. So we really know that this area in Babati is a place where we have to focus intensely on building living walls. A few other hot spots we've identified that we're starting to work intensely in now is West Kilimanjaro. Again, you can see Mount Kilimanjaro here and to the west of it, two hot spots of BOMA conflict. Now, before we get right into the, into the video showing you a living wall, I wanted to give you just a bit of a sense here with this even being a little bit outdated because we've recently been building a lot of living walls that right now we actually have over 1500 living walls on the landscape protecting livestock from predators at night with over 17,000 people benefiting from these living walls and a population of about 500 lions protected from retaliation killing. Now with that, I'd like to pass this on now to my colleague Elvis uh, in a video of him giving you a tour of a living wall in the field. And I believe this video is going to be played uh, by Joe uh, on your end. Hi everyone. Thank you for joining us on Global Biodiversity Festival. Uh, my name is Elvis Kisimir, working at African People and Wildlife uh, as Human Wildlife Prevention Program Officer. You see behind me uh, there is a living wall. This is one of our great uh, interventions we are using to prevent a predator from attacking livestock inside the boma. As you see, this type of the boma is made up of Comifora africanas, the pole you see inside, and chain link. Let me go inside and show you uh, how the livestock live inside the boma. Inside the living wall, there is number of enclosures inside. As you see, uh, this is different from the outside. 
Uh, we didn't put uh, Comifera Africanas or chain link because after installing a uh, living wall around, uh, livestock inside are safe. So uh, they have to divide uh, enclosures of uh, different type of the livestock. For instance, you see that side over there, uh, that's where uh, the cattle lives. And that side over there, the other enclosure, the second, is where you find shorts, goats and sheep. And this enclosure is where uh, they keep calves. So these people now are safe. They coexist with wildlife because uh, they normally, obviously, depend on uh, livestock. Now their life is improved. And also, uh, the number of big cats in this area is increasing because we are living very close to Tarangiri National Park. Uh, so this is good news for us because uh, seeing people uh, living with wildlife and no more fighting between them, this is a good thing. Very simple. Let me show the entrance. Uh, from this side, this is the wall, living wall. This is a strong wall. Uh, it's very difficult for the predator to break and pass and go inside and kill the livestock. And here you see this is the gate. You just push it and put uh, the padlock. Livestock inside the living wall are safe. Let me open for cattle to climb inside the boma. As you see, the lock of this area depends on livestock. Livestock is everything. It's like their bank account, so they depend on livestock. Livestock is everything for the Maasai. So, after uh, getting in, now you push it and lock it. So livestock are safe inside. All right, Liz, that was such a great video. That was, that was awesome. You have to thank Elvis for us. That was, that was, and, and I mean, at the end too, what a, what an effect bringing the cattle in at the end to really illustrate uh, the, how those bomas are so, so good for protection. Oh, Liz, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we were, we were very grateful that Elvis was be able to go uh, out to a living wall just this past week. Um, and again, the community members that allow us to come and visit them early in the morning when they're bringing the cattle in and out. Uh, part of our community engagement strategy is to have these positive relationships with the communities, um, particularly you know, the beneficiaries of this Living Wall program who allow us then to come in and check up on the Living Wall, you know, not just for a video like this, but also to make sure it's still functioning. So Elvis will do a full assessment, make sure that the trees are growing well, that the hinges on the door work well, um, so that that living wall can be the sustainable long-term solution we intend it to be. Awesome. Well, Liz, what do you think? Is it time to bring uh, our final uh, speaker, Priska, in to hang out with us? Yes, I think Priska is ready to go. And again, I will screen share for her. Uh, Perfect. Well, let's let's bring her in here now. Hey, Priska, how are you? I'm very fine, Joe. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I love your your background. Another nice green background. Thank you so much. Uh, as you said, my name is Priska Urio, and I'm a gender specialist for the African people and wildlife here in Tanzania. I'm glad to be uh, one of the presenters or to take part in Global Biodiversity Festival today. And as a person, I am passionate about uplifting the lives of the minority in the community. And this led me to, into specializing uh, in gender and development. Uh, in our community, especially in the rural areas like the Maasai staples where we work, women and girls are the most marginalized groups. They like power to decision making at the very angle of this, um, and from the household level to the community level. They do not own uh, productive resources and their participation in public sphere is very limited. Uh, for example, uh, taking positions in leadership. 
And this is because of some outdated culture and traditional practices and the patriarch system in our community. There are some sectors up to now uh, that have limited amount of women representation in leadership positions here in Tanzania. Uh, for example, um, the conservation sector in our country has not yet got enough women in power. And again, this is because of the community perception and they perceive it to be more of uh, roles of men. Um, African people and wildlife had to pilot the Women in Conservation Internship Initiative, um, which offered a platform for African girls to learn a lot about conservation and taking part in educating women and school children about the conservation. So uh, taking an example of former intern Fatuma Alex, who is now an employee of uh, African People and Wildlife, uh, before join, joining APW as an intern, um, she had not so much interest about the conservation, but after arriving at Noloholo Environmental Center of Excellence, then she started seeing white animals and she got excited about them. And she started thinking of how to uh, preserve them for the pre uh, present and future uh, generation. So uh, she has stimulated the Maasai girls, uh, their passion and interest in the field of uh, environmental and wildlife conservation. Uh, as during her internship with the African people and wildlife, she visited women groups and girls to tell them about her own experience of conservation before and joining the African people and wildlife. So African people and wildlife uh, is relaunching the Women in Conservation Internship uh, Initiative in the near future to ensure that uh, we accommodate more African girls and giving them a broad opportunity of learning uh, from all of, of our programs and uh, moreover, uh, being able to challenge the updated norms and cultural practices. And this actually um, will uh, take different leadership uh, positions uh, in the sector of wildlife uh, and conservation. So as we work in collaboration with Tanzania National Parks Authority and other conservation authorities in Tanzania, uh, the women interns will also learn the protection and development of new uh, endangered habitats. Uh, another important uh, area in our work is challenging gender inequality and finding the balance between girls and boys uh, rights, roles and responsibilities. Uh, we have initiated uh, the girls clubs in 10 schools to pilot uh, and the aim of this is to create awareness to the girls on their rights and helping them uh, build the self-esteem and uh, confidence. So we believe in creating a good foundation for these future women leaders. Uh, we also have a friendly environmental women beekeeping project, which is part of the Women Enterprises program. And we believe that if a woman is financially stable, then she can acquire other rights, like uh, taking part in decision-making processes, owning resources, and many other more. So as African people and wildlife, uh, we have organized women groups and facilitated them to start up the beekeeping project by giving them trainings of beekeeping, startup funding, uh, which was given in kind, and creating a market linkage uh, that they sell their bee products like honey and other value-added products. Uh, the women returns all this by simply engaging in conservation by protecting the biodiversity through planting trees in public areas like the markets, the schools, hospitals, and other places. And we have more than 100 women groups involving themselves in beekeeping with a total number of more than a thousand members. And we have examples of women that have managed sending their children to school as a result of engaging the beekeeping project. So I can just uh, mention a few like uh, Nasinyari Damas of Logosiret Village and Mama Neem of uh, Logosoit Village that have taken their girls to advanced secondary school as a result of engaging themselves in these uh, friendly environmental uh, projects. So women do gain confidence and power of deciding on their different uses of the household resources. And this is because uh, they also take part in producing. They no longer stay at home and being called some unpleasant names like goalkeepers. I can just cite an example of a special seat counselor uh, who is a member of Mkombozi group uh, at uh, Lobosiret village. So uh, uh, her mother, uh, who we refer her as Mama Helena, joined the women beekeeping, uh, beekeeping group uh, and she actually ins inspired the daughter to also participate in groups because her income increased and she started meeting the household demands and the needs. 
So after seeing that, she joined the Mkombozi group and she gained confidence in the ability to dare standing for the party competition for the position of the special seat ward councillor, and she won. And this is an ongoing work that we believe will reach as many women as possible and create a change we want to see in this world. Uh, so these women uh, meet and work in their program building. This is a women enterprise center, which is situated at Lobo Siret village in Simanjiro district. Uh, in this building, they process and pack honey after harvesting. They also engage uh, themselves in different related activities like making candles, skincare oil and lip balms. And all these are the bee value added products which have made out of bees products. So the women groups have a plan of extending their business uh, by learning additional skills like making food be wax wraps. This aims at minimizing the effects of plastic in the foods we eat. Um, this building also serves as a market outlet for the women's product and a good platform for them to gather in their lending and saving groups for networking and learning different other skills. For example, making uh, the bead bracelets and the chains, and hence, they sell them and increase the household income. Uh, and the study also shows that uh, women give greater priority to protection and improving the capacity of nature, maintaining farming, lands, and caring for nature in the environment's future. So as far as biodiversity is closely connected to development, access to resources, income generating activities, food and essential household products, then it is important for women to take part. And lastly, I would just like to remind you that uh, yesterday was World Bee Day and we filmed some activities at the center with our beekeeping program officer, Samson Bear. So welcome to watch. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Samson Bear. I'm working with African People and Wildlife uh, as a beekeeping program officer. Uh, I'm here at uh, the Women Enterprise Center in Tanzania's Maasai Step. Uh, let's talk ab about uh, uh, a bit about Mama Sali. Mama Sali is in Swahili word, which means uh, honey, and uh, the Mama Sali. Uh, it's a bridge gap between the, the market and the women product. Today, uh, we have a special activity at celebrating women, uh, at celebrating uh, well be Day at this, uh, our Women Enterprise Center. The women are making candles. Uh, as you've seen here, it's the process of making candles which women are doing. The women are starting to cutting down the block of uh, beeswax, the pure beeswax, and uh, the second uh, the second process should be put on the on the fire there on the on the gaze, and then uh, the women are taking the this melted beeswax to the to the container, then the container. Will be pouring uh, this beeswax to the candle molds as you see there and then after after pulling after cooling the, 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 the beeswax to the to the candle mold then you see the women are take out this has been cooling for some for, for some minutes then they take out as you've seen, they're taken to the mold from different shape, and then we have a several types of mold. Let us see this this different type of candle. We have a, a Christmas candle. We have an elephant. We have a uh, tortoise, horse, horse truck. We have a house, and uh, we have a uh, elephant mode candle. Oh, 
That's wonderful. One of the activity which women are doing uh, is planting uh, trees to their social areas, like uh, this uh, this one area which they are uh, women their own is their enterprise center. It's continuous activity uh, of women doing uh, to conserve environment uh, and to for them and to mobilize um, other other peoples like other groups like women are uh, doing different uh, groups to planting trees around their social areas like hospital uh, schools even government um, offices the women are doing very great job so uh, one of the emphasize uh, for the women to contribute the conservation of the uh, environment is to planting trees like uh, this in, in genius one uh, it's a wonderful work the women are very very active to contribute uh, the way uh, of um, uh, empowering and uh, conserve the environment All right, I'm going to bring myself back in here after that really cool video and let's bring Prisca back in here for a moment. Prisca, those candles are incredible. I uh, was not expecting that, that, that variety of really cool designs. Wow, thank you so much. We are glad. All right. Well, great work you're doing empowering uh, women in the community to take a larger role in conservation. Uh, and then are you finding you've got a great young generation of of girls coming up now who are excited about conservation and, and starting to join the programs? Oh yes, exactly. We find those excited and energetic girls and we find them from uh, the primary schools to secondary schools because as I have said that uh, we have this program, uh, the girls uh, clubs. So we now implant kind of uh, the, 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 the gospel that we want them to, to, to preach, the gospel that we want them to hear. So. We have been creating that energetic team and that we see it's really not even the future uh, uh, the future leaders but from now they are taking action they also clean environment they plant trees the primary and secondary school children and they even educate their parents about the impacts of uh biodiversity and not protecting the biodiversity so really i see that and even awesome. through the, our upcoming uh women internship conservation initiative we also uh create uh women who will take uh different positions in the conservation sector in tanzania so i really see that all right let me bring some of the team back in here let's get ramadani back in here let's get liz back in here neovitis if you're still there we'll bring you back in uh, as well, if you can pop your camera on. Um, there we go. Let's bring them in. Uh, wow, what a, a absolute pleasure to, to have this team joining us today. And of course, those amazing videos that we, uh, we had sent in uh, from other members uh, of the team, like Samson uh, and Elvis. And uh, World Bee Day yesterday, World Biodiversity Day on uh, Sunday, never a, a dull moment at African People and Wildlife. Yeah. for sure yeah awesome well look i want to start off with a huge shout out oh looks like we lost ramadani maybe he got disconnected oh there we go let's bring him back in for a second there he yeah. is uh hey ramadani and thank you for the work you're doing with the kids i know there's there's a 95 person team kind of working with liz collecting some of those that gis and i imagine that team of 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 youth will eventually have a, a more active role getting out in the field soon Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I can't. I'm. I'm losing. I, I can't hear you. are breaking up, Joe. Oh, sorry, yeah, Ramadan, saying... I was just saying that 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 you've got a great team of youth that are going to be future GIS specialists out in the field, getting great data. <laughs> we certainly hope so. <laughs> I think he's having connectivity yeah. issues. All right. They're, they're collecting well, right now. Yeah, that's okay. Technology doesn't always cooperate, but I'm glad it worked <laughs> while you were presenting. That's the most important thing. Neovitis, Elizabeth, Prisca, Ramadani, thank you so much for being with us today, for representing Tanzania, for representing your community, 
uh, and the incredible work you're doing really across the country. Thank you very much, uh, Joe. All right. It was really a pleasure Thank presenting you. what Thank we're doing and uh, yeah. Awesome. Participating sure. in this global uh, biofest. Thank you. Have a great rest of the weekend. Have a happy World Biodiversity Day. And I can't wait to continue following all the great work you're doing. And I'll pop up a banner here one more time with the website, AfricanPeopleAndWildlife.org, uh, where people can visit, check out the work. And of course, if possible, uh, donate <laughs> to help this great work continue. That's right, right down there. We've got, uh, uh, yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. What a pleasure. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joe. Have a good one. All right. We're going to slide the team backstage here. And uh, we are going to take a little journey now. We're going to go to the continent of South Africa. Another amazing team that we have, or sorry, South America. Another amazing team that we have joining us uh, live from around the world today. And so to just to kind of introduce, Tompkins Conservation believes the world can be more wild beautiful and equitable. They protected primeval forests and national parks, helped missing species come home, and campaigned to keep threatened rivers wild and free. So rewilding is a really important, a key approach to conservation, with Rewilding Chile and Rewilding Argentina becoming independent offspring nonprofits, um, of which Tompkins Conservation is a strategic collaborator. So this is what we're going to explore today, meeting representatives from both programs to share a little bit of the work they're doing to protect Patagonia. So I'm going to introduce both of our speakers now, uh, and then we're going to start with one program and transition to the second. So we have Deanna Friedrich joining us today. She is the Patagonia Azul Parks and Communities Coordinator with Rewilding Argentina. Deanna is a naturalist and adventurer. She received a degree in nature conservation in South Africa that led her to work in several nature reserves in Zimbabwe, Kenya, and Tanzania. She worked as a field technician with Rewilding Argentina's projects to reintroduce giant anteaters and red and green macaws. So let's say a quick hi now. Let's bring her in. Hey, Deanna, how are you? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. All right. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, and we're going to have you take over in just a moment, but I want to introduce your colleague first. So just bear with me for a second. I'm now going to bring in Marcella um, um, Quiroz. She is leads the strategies and partnerships team of Rewilding Chile. Born in Santiago, Marcella studied Hispanic American literature at the University of Chile and journalism at the Catholic University uh, of Chile. She's a rewilding, uh, joined the team in 2016, um, and has worked over a decade on different projects related to tourism and conservation in Chile and Patagonia. So I'm going to bring her in for a quick hello. Hey, Marcella, how are you? Hi, nice to be here. Nice to see you, Joe. Hola, Diana. All right, very cool. So great to have you joining us live today. I'm going to tuck you backstage for a few minutes, uh, but we're going to visit with you shortly. Diana, it's so great to have you with us today. Uh, representing uh, Rewilding Argentina. Uh, and yeah, if you're ready, we'll let you take over for a little bit. Thank you, Joe, for the nice introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I feel very, very honored to be here with you representing Rewilding So, Deanna, can I just pause you just for a second? The, the yeah. audio isn't coming through uh, really great on the microphone right now. Are you using a headset? No, I'm not. Uh, uh, this one? Yeah, maybe try and plug in and see if we can get the microphone a little better. For whatever reason, it sounds almost like you're underwater. Uh, can you hear me better now? Oh, wow. That is perfect. That is so good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So I'll start again. Uh, so I feel very, very honored to be here uh, representing Rewilding Argentina and two of the great projects that this organization is carrying out in my home country. I am right now talking to you from southern South America in the region uh, that they call Patagonia. I've been living here for a few years. Uh, they feel like a lifetime. And in the past three years, I've been coordinating the Patagonia Sul project at the Wild Coast in Camarones. Um, I will talk about a bit uh, of two projects uh, from Rewilding Argentina the Patagonia Sul project in the south, and then another one in the north that's called the Iberá Park. I'll start in the south, where in fact, 
Uh, we are working in the very area that Poppy was talking about yesterday in the very first presentation of this festival about the penguins. Uh, way before we arrived, scientists like Poppy and organizations like the Global Penguin Society worked very hard and achieved that the UNESCO designated this area as a biosphere reserve. It's actually a very, very large biosphere reserve that is called Patagonia Sul. And it encompasses more than 3 million hectares on land and at the ocean. So we, as Rewilding Argentina, we work within that framework with the same name, Patagonia Sul, which means Blue Patagonia. And we work on mainly laws that enhance the protection of biodiversity around here within the area, uh, especially with threats like the fishing industry and bottom trawling, which affect this area very much. Then also restoring ecosystems that have been heavily affected by human activity through, through rewilding, and then also working with the community to very slowly transition towards a local and regenerative co culture. Um, we have recorded a video in case the Wi-Fi failed, which happens very often around here. So I'll leave you with that, uh, which is mainly about the community actions that we do and how we work with the local economy. And then I'll be very happy to answer any questions you might have. In Patagonia Sul, we are part of the community of Camarones. Camarones is a tiny and very isolated town right on the edge of the wild Atlantic Ocean in Patagonia. We envision a future where organizations and community groups and entrepreneurs and social innovators work together towards a future where the culture is a regenerative force instead of a destructive one. And the economy, a local economy based on abundance and regeneration. We also started creating more ways to connect to the ocean. Although Camarones sits right on the beach, many people don't have a good relationship with the ocean. So through the Ocean Club, we started teaching kids and even adults how to swim and to snorkel. And a whole new world opened up to them, the underwater world. We also started organizing beach cleanups with a local group that calls itself Friends of the Ocean in order to educate about just how much plastic floats around in our ocean and washes up to the beaches that seem so pristine and so untouched. And then we are also working on creating alternatives for the economy. A new economy that is based on a profound understanding of the functions and processes that sustain the life of ecosystems on this earth. Based also on the understanding of our interconnection and interdependence. These alternatives include regenerative ocean farming and the production of local, organic, agroecological vegetables and also regenerative grazing planning on the land that surrounds us here. We firmly believe that our collective narrative of who we are and what future we want affects the future that we create and that the world as we know it is a result of how we relate to each other and to the natural processes and the ecosystems that surround us. We need them to be vibrant and functional and healthy and as diverse as they can be. Las granjas marinas regenerativas son sistemas productivos basados en el ecosistema. Se pueden cultivar tanto moluscos como algas y la idea es hacer un conjunto de sistemas donde todos los nutrientes que se generan con las heces de moluscos, por ejemplo, sean aprovechados por las algas. La principal función que tienen las granjas marinas regenerativas es establecer sistemas de cultivo que apunten a aprovechar los nutrientes disponibles al mismo tiempo que permiten secuestrar dióxido de carbono de la atmósfera, lo que contribuye a mitigar los efectos del cambio climático, como así también la disminución de la acidez de los océanos. Lo que se busca es fortalecer el ecosistema y beneficiarlo y al mismo tiempo que se lo torna más productivo. La importancia que tienen las granjas Justamente es que se está aprovechando el mar como un medio productivo sin afectar el ecosistema y generamos proteínas de muy alta calidad con contenidos grasos realmente bajos y también 
tenemos por otro lado lo que son las proteínas derivadas de las algas que tienen aportes significativos de omega 3 que tiende a reforzar lo que es el sistema inmune. Las formas de cultivo son sistemas verticales tendidos en el mar y esencialmente consisten en cuerdas sintéticas que sostienen estructuras de cultivo que nos permiten tener conectados de alguna forma todo lo que son los moluscos. Uno de los casos más reconocidos de granjas marinas es la de Green Wave, que es un productor de pequeña escala en un primer momento y hoy en día tiene como principal objetivo fortalecer todo lo que es la agricultura regenerativa marina a lo largo del mundo y ya cuenta con más de 100 proyectos encaminados. El Club del Mar es un programa que empezamos hace dos años más o menos cuando identificamos que faltaba mucho en actividades que conectaran a lo que son los jóvenes del pueblo y a los niños con el tema del mar, con disfrutarlo desde otro lado, con conocer qué es lo que hay abajo del agua. Entonces decidimos empezar a hacer este programa para que ellos se puedan acercar mediante el snorkel, el kayak, el buceo y actividades acuáticas a conocer la biodiversidad marina y obviamente a que sean los primeros guardianes para poder conservarla. Actividades como las del Club del Mar en realidad eh, tienen un trasfondo de, que tiene que ver con nuestro objetivo de que, por ejemplo, en este caso la comunidad de camarones eh, pueda volver a ver y a valorar todo lo que tiene enfrente, todo este mar que ofrece un montón de posibilidades, no solo desde la belleza, sino también desde las oportunidades, por ejemplo, de eh, generar futuros eh, emprendimientos turísticos para que la gente que viene acá a Camarones pueda disfrutar todo lo que tiene para ofrecer. Por ejemplo, nosotros con el Club del Mar esperamos generar a futuro eh, guardianes que quieran ser emprendedores y tener un emprendimiento de kayak o de operadores de buceo. Es un poco revalorizar todo lo que tienen y también mostrarlo con orgullo y, y querer compartirlo con, con el resto de, de la gente. El Club del Mar en 5 o 10 años lo veo como un programa que pueda tener diferentes deportes, eh, desde navegación a vela, kayak, eh, clínicas de buceo, que se den cursos, eh, obviamente también que se puedan dar cursos pequeños sobre biodiversidad marina, más específicos, fotografía subacuática, no sé, lo veo como algo con muchas más aristas para disfrutarlo. Very, very cool. As a, as a diver for well over a decade, I am very biased to the ocean. I love uh, seeing those images, seeing that, that, that protection work that's happening. And I do want to share a link here. Uh, I popped it up a, a, earlier in the video, but a link to the Instagram if, if people want to follow along, learn more uh, about the project. And um, yeah, wow. I, I, Diana, do you, do you manage to get out on the water often? Yes, we do. We do get out very often and it's really wonderful how much wildlife you can see. Um, not only diving, you see dolphins and whales and sea lions and penguins everywhere, especially between October and May. All right, I'm going to make a mental note on my calendar here that that's the time to come down and get into the water. Yes, definitely. All right, very cool. Well, I know you have a second program to highlight, so uh, we'll let you introduce it and we've got another great video. Okay, so the second project is further north in Argentina in the Corrientes province and uh, that's the oldest project from rewilding Argentina in Argentina. Um, it's in a huge wetland that they call Ibera and for many, many years that wetland has been completely uh, devastated. All the wildlife has been hunted out and in the past 25 years, Rewilding Argentina has started um, revaluing that ecosystem as a very important area for biodiversity and mainly working on nature tourism and reintrodu reintroducing all the species that have been lost in the, in the past 100 years. Um, they're very, very beautiful cases of success of reintroducing animals and seeing how the ecosystems respond. And last year, there were or even, no, I think February this year, there were huge wildfires affecting this ecosystem, which had 
obviously very bad effects on the on the ecosystem and some some areas but also we learned that really diversity gives this ecosystem its resilience and how boosting it has helped it recover quite quickly and yeah i'll let you watch the video and then afterwards we'll talk, talk a bit about what we learned with these wildfires and mainly En el norte de Iberá trabajamos en la reintroducción del guacamayo rojo, el muitú, el pecarí de collar y los hormigueros gigantes. Como parte de la restauración de Iberá, también trabajamos con las comunidades locales acompañando su desarrollo económico, buscando fomentar economías basadas en el turismo y la observación de fauna y que sean prácticas amigables con el medio ambiente. Donde las comunidades locales puedan cuidar este ecosistema completo y sano y a la vez beneficiarse de ellos, mostrando la naturaleza que tienen para que sean ellos los protagonistas. Estás volando chimangos. Pensé que eran guacamayos en un momento. Este verano en Corrientes fue muy particular, ya que veníamos de dos años con sequías muy intensas y altas temperaturas, lo que generó incendios con magnitudes y dimensiones muy grandes. Casi un mes estuvimos combatiendo el fuego. Afectó casi un 80% de nuestra superficie. Y arrasó con más de 170.000 hectáreas del Gran Parque Ibera. Afectó a los jaulones que utilizamos para los proyectos de reintroducción, a nuestro centro de operaciones en el lugar y a la mayoría de la infraestructura que teníamos en la reserva. En particular, en el proyecto Guacamayo, el fuego llegó cuando estábamos en plena temporada reproductiva. Tuvimos que evacuar a todos los pichones que habían nacido en la temporada junto con sus padres. Los tuvimos que llevar a un lugar seguro en el centro de Aguará para poder tratarlos, ya que estaban enfermos a causa de, del humo. En total, evacuamos a cuatro pichones eh, de los cuales dos lamentablemente no pudieron sobrevivir y murieron por los efectos del humo en, en sus pulmones. Hemos tenido dos animales que sufrieron quemaduras. Uno es un oso hormiguero que tuvo quemaduras tanto en sus miembros, en las patas delanteras como en las patas traseras y en la trompa. Tuvimos que intervenirlo y llevarlo al centro de rescate de los osos en la estación biológica de Corrientes, donde después de pasar dos meses de tratamientos, de eh, transfusión de sangre, de medicaciones, con alegría podemos decir que eh, la semana pasada fue liberado nuevamente y desde entonces anda caminando por el inmenso bosque que tenemos en el portal Chabalito. Días después del gran incendio que tuvimos, comenzamos rápidamente a trabajar en toda la restauración del portal, en los jaulones que fueron quemados, alambrados y apoyándonos en los proyectos de reintroducción de guacamayos y de muitú. Hoy más que nunca se hace evidente la importancia de trabajar con especies como el guacamayo rojo y el muitú, que se consideran regeneradores de bosques, ya que consumen frutos y semillas de, de los montes nativos y mediante la dispersión pueden regenerar los bosques. Los incendios resaltaron la importancia de tener ecosistemas sanos, completos y funcionales, ya que son más resilientes frente a estos eventos catastróficos que cada vez van a ser más frecuentes como consecuencia del cambio climático. All right, so let's bring you back in here, Deanna. I'm going to share a link here right now. I didn't want to share during the presentation because I didn't want to cover the captions, but there's a link here to help donate and and uh, and support that work. So I do want to make sure that we share that link out uh, for people to see. Obviously, you want to visit um, to find out more uh, and make those donations because donations are so critical for the work uh, that is being done. And it is great work. And I know that because there's there's people singing your praises in the chat right now saying the work of rewilding Argentina is fantastic, especially after the wildfires in January, how quickly uh, you know you guys acted to protect the species there. So lots of praise coming in via the chat for these two amazing projects. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it has been wild, the fires, um, but we, we got so much support from the community. And, and yeah, we feel very, very happy that many people have 
known about this area for so long and now they, they were able to really help. What we've learned is that we need to restore uh, the fencing of Ibera Park now and they, we don't have to use wooden poles anymore, not only because we don't want to uh, cut down trees to make fences, but also because they burn and wildfires like these in this climate change era um, might be very usual now. And so we have to invent something else. And also that fences are very, very important because now domestic cattle is invading these parks. So that is very important. And that is why we need the support of, of the community. Absolutely. And then, and then again, how important it is to have biodiversity because biodiversity builds resilience and makes these ecosystems faster at recovering from these yep. disasters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. Resilient ecosystems, biodiversity ecosystems bounce back quicker. That's just, yeah. just the way it works. All right. Well, Deanna, I'm going to tuck you backstage temporarily while we bring your colleague in. Uh, and we're going to okay. explore uh, a, a different uh, a different project, a different country. But we will see you again shortly. So Thank you so just, much. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to do a little switcheroo here. We're going to bring uh, Marcella in. Hey, Marcella, how are you? Well, fine. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, my name is Marcela Quiroz from Rewild in Chile, and I am speaking from the beautiful and rainy Puerto Vara city, which is the town where I live, and actually is the gate of entrance to Chilean Patagonia. Uh, since 2007, I have been working in different projects related with tourism and conservation to try to protect this amazing place, Patagonia, which is truly one of the last wild places that we have on Earth. Uh, after many years exploring the territory, I have been lucky enough to witness all this beauty. And when you do so, there's really no turning back. It's kind of like a moral imperative to try to protect the places that you love so deeply. And that's exactly what we do at Rewild in Chile. We try to reverse the extinction at, and climate crisis uh, using three main strategies. First, we protect the territory under the maximum possible conservation categories that we have in our country, which is national park on the land and marine parks on the water. We also restore damage ecosystem and help them regain its natural balance again. And we also connect people with, with nature. We believe that conservation is not successful unless communities are profoundly involved. We want them to be proud of the territory and become the first line of defense uh, of, of, of this amazing territory. So after three uh, decades of work, we have uh, helped create seven national parks and expand three others. Uh, how have we done this? We have uh, donated over a million acres to the Chilean state which has been leveraged by 11 million acres of, of land. So if you add uh, the, the, the national parks that we have here crea helped create with the already existing national parks, you have the root of parks of Chilean Patagonia. This is our conservation landscape. And uh, we are speaking about a 1700 mile scenic routes that spans from one third of Chile, crosses 17 national parks, 60 gateway communities, and protects 28 million acres of wilderness. This is a mosaic of beauty composed by wetlands, temperate rainforests, subantarctic forests, uh, ice fields, and one of the largest fuel systems in the world. And actually, it's a green land for the planet. Um, it's one of the largest carbon sink of South America, and it stores three times more, more carbon per hectare than the Amazon forest. But what is underneath this conservation vision, the root of parks of Patagonia? We want national parks to be seen as an investment, not as an expense. And we want to present them as an alternative of economic development for surrounding communities versus extract extractive activities that see nature as a mer merely resource. So uh, for doing so, we have helped create and donated to the Chilean government two ready-to-use parks, Patagonia National Park and Pumalín National Parks. Ready-to-use parks because we crafted all the public access, campgrounds, trails, lodging, because at the end of the day, you will only protect what you love and you will only love what you know. So this is a, an, an emblematic case. And the video that I wanted to, to show you now and share with all of you explains a little bit the rewilding process that has been taking place in Patagonia National Park uh, and how we have helped turn a sheep ranch into a national park. 
Actually, Netflix recently launched a series of the greatest national parks of the world narrated by Barack Obama. And Patagonia National Park is highlighted in one of these videos. Uh, we are very proud because one entire chapter is dedicated to the parks of Chile and Patagonia. And Cristian Saucedo, our wildlife director, uh, was crucial uh, in supporting the filming crew. And I want you to invite to see this video that narrates a little bit the, the, the rewilding process that have been taking place in Patagonia National Park. Mi nombre es Cristian Saucedo y he estado trabajando estos últimos 15 años en la zona del Parque Nacional Patagonia, en el sur de Chile. Rewilding básicamente es eh, reasilvestrar, renaturalizar, eh, es volver a lo original. De alguna forma, eh, restablecer la, las relaciones y las diferentes interacciones que existen en la naturaleza, donde todas las especies juegan un rol importante y todas las especies tienen interacciones con otras. Es decir, ninguna de estas especies está por obra del azar en la naturaleza. Acá en el Parque Patagonia, eh, entre los proyectos de rewilding que hemos desarrollado, ha estado aquel... Eh, dirigió el monitoreo del puma como predador tope y clave del ecosistema. Eh, hemos desarrollado monitoreos permanentes respecto a la población de Guanaco, Censo, y la iniciativa más reciente es la relacionada a la conservación del ñandú, a, a prevenir o a evitar la extinción local y desarrollar un programa de recuperación y fortalecimiento poblacional. Ha sido muy emocionante eh, eh, el aprendizaje que hemos tenido con el trabajo del Ñandú eh, desde la primera vez eh, que incubamos eh, un, un huevo o vimos el nacimiento del primer charito. Eh, ha sido una emoción muy grande. De alguna forma sentimos que trabajamos con eh, un pequeño dinosaurio, un dinosaurio viviente, esos tremendos huevos, esas patas de dinosaurio. Eh, y la verdad no nos deja de emocionar en cada temporada reproductiva cuando vemos el primer huevo, el primer charito que nace, la verdad que, que nos llena de emoción, nos llena de esperanza de que, de que cada uno de esos representa una, una oportunidad, una posibilidad de recuperación del Ñandú, de avanzar con el rewilding acá en el Parque Nacional Patagonia. Ver que en el fondo las personas disfrutan viniendo al parque, interactuando con los guanacos, eh, pudiendo observar pumas y toda la vida silvestre del lugar, eh, es el mejor regalo y el mejor ejemplo de éxito de todo el trabajo de rewilding que se ha desarrollado aquí en el Parque Nacional Patagonia. What a great clip. I'm just going to pop the video out here. And uh, as we chat for a moment, I'm going to share a couple of links here. So I'm going to start with this one there. Uh, yeah, what a cool cl uh, clip. What an amazing project to be part of and to be featured on that Netflix documentary. I'm sure everybody's really excited. Uh, the whole team must yes. be really excited. Yes, it's, it, we're so proud to see the national parks showcasing in, in, in this visibility worldwide and the images of the Guanacos are amazing. Imagine that 15 years ago, if you have like a time capsule, this will be a sheep ranch with 30,000 sheep, degraded um, grasslands. And now you can see these Guanacos running all over, uh, ecosystem recovering. So it's, it's actually a story of hope, uh, of yeah. how if we work in collaboration, we can turn the clock in the other direction. Absolutely amazing. I'm going to pop my screen share back up because you sent so many great 
images through to me, here to me. So I want to make sure that we <laughs> share some of these images while while you're you're presenting as well. So I know you have another uh, project to tell us about. So I'll let you take over for a little yes. bit. Yes, thank you, Joe. Um, in this rewilding work that we have been uh, doing for almost 30 years, uh, one of the main efforts have been to try to save uh, the Wemul deer out of the extinction. The Wemul deer, it's an endemic and Patagonian deer, actually it's the southernmost deer of the world, uh, which plays a key ecological role in Patagonia. It's like the gardener of the forest. Uh, unfortunately, uh, its numbers have been reduced to roughly 1,500 individuals, which represent less than 1% of the original population. So really the clock is ticking for, for this emblematic species, which is actually really related with the Chilean and Patagonian identity. It's uh, highlighted in our code of arms. So losing these species, as you know, in any extinction uh, case, uh, it's more than losing the species itself. Wemul currently lives in very fragmented populations and uh, dispersed in pockets of, of, uh, on, on the territory of the root of parks and also in Argentina. And through these years, we have been working to try to reestablish uh, the corridors to connect the pockets of, of populations, reduce the threats, uh, which are mainly reduction of habitat, competition with livestock, um, exotic species like the uh, wild boar and the red deer, poaching and dogs. Uh, and we also want to promote the active management uh, to, boost it, to boost the population of, of these uh, emblematic species. And actually, I'm proud to announce that we are about to uh, build the first uh, rescue and rehabilitation center for the Wemul deer in Cerro Castillo National Park, uh, with the vision of uh, uh, establishing a, a breeding center uh, in, the, in the midterm. This uh, all this work that we have been doing, starting in Patagonia National Park in the video that you just saw, and the and the efforts of reestablishing the Wemul population al along the route of parks, is part of our National Wemul Corridor Initiative, which is a public-private collaboration collaborative initiative uh, that is try to reestablish key ecological corridors for the Wemul deer, and this involves not only national parks, public lands, but also private lands working with the farmers to promote wildlife friendly practices and with our colleagues in Argentina to reestablish transboundary corridors. So it's a collaborative uh, action that we are uh, developing in all these vertebral spine of the root of parks of Chile and Patagonia. And actually the little fellow, the Wemul deer that you are seeing here, uh, was recently hi highlighted as one of the 20 key manuals for ecosystem restoration. This means that focusing our rewilding efforts in the Wemul deer, you will generate a domino effect that will impact a uh, different species uh, like the Magallanic woodpecker, fungus, uh, Magallanic uh, endemic orchids, and so on. So really our efforts uh, to saving the Wemul deer out of the extinction is related to try to reestablish the, um, the, the ecosystem and help the ecosystem to have uh, its, its balance again. Uh, this is a 24-7 uh, job, uh, and it's done for by a team of Wemul experts. I call them Wemul whispers. Uh, and the beautiful thing is that most of them were former um, workers of the Chip Ranch, so they have this. They have realigned their gaucho experience towards the protection of the Wemul deer. So this is a very very nice example of how rewilding process is also an interior process uh, related with pride, local identity. Uh, so I would like you to uh, see the daily routine of Chino, or Cristian Rivera, who is our Wemul whisperer, uh, monitoring the Wemul subpopulation in Patagonia National Park in the, north, uh, the northwest area of the park, which is an area which is barely, uh, severely affected by uh, the presence of cows, um, which are competing um, with the habitat by the Wemul and blocking its dispersal. So let's see what Chino does um, in Patagonia National Park. Mi nombre es Cristian Rivera y trabajo en el Parque Patagonia desde el 2006 más o menos en monitoreo de Wemules. Mi rutina diaria es más o menos rastreo, acercamiento a los animales y trabajar con trampas cámaras. Un 
un día típico de trabajo es, me levanto en la mañana alrededor de las 6, 6 y media, me tomo unos buenos mates, un buen desayuno y empiezo a arreglar mi equipo de, de trabajo, que son pilas, GPS, antena, el receptor y ahí parto hacia mi lugar de trabajo al monitoreo. Yo siento que vivir en medio de la naturaleza es estar tranquilo, más que nada, y aprender cosas de la misma naturaleza, de los animales, de todos los animales que uno está monitoreando en el lugar. Encontrarme con los huemules me produce emoción, alegría, y de poder monitorearlos, sacarles fotos, de, y de saber más que nada cómo, cómo viven como es la especie. Antes trabajaba en ganadería, trabajaba en otras cosas totalmente distintas a, a fauna y a, y a la vida silvestre. La fauna más que nada que permanezca en el lugar para mantener el ecosistema, para mantener las especies que están en extinción y las que se están cada vez perdiendo. All right, let's take that video down there. And thank you for that clip. It's so great to see kind of the day in the life of, of somebody who's working so hard on one of these conservation projects. Yes, it's a 24-7 job. Uh, the threat does not stop. And the job for trying to save the Wemul out of extinction, it's, it's you know, it's, it's very important for us and for the world. Absolutely. Every species we lose is something that we can't get back. Every species matters. Every species plays a role in their ecosystem. Um, we can't play games taking pieces in and out. Exactly. And also it's very important for the cultural identity. So mm. we lose a part of ourselves when we lose one species. I think that's very important to highlight as well. All right. Let's bring Deanna back in here for a moment. Uh, hey, Deanna, Hello. Uh, two amazing organizations, offspring of uh, Tompkins Conservation, and it's, it's awesome to see two programs flourishing uh, into two uh, independent organizations, both doing incredible work in Patagonia and protecting one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I think you both agree with me. Uh, absolutely amazing. And, you know, one thing that was coming in through the chat was volunteers. Are there volunteer opportunities with the organizations? Yes. Uh... Here in Patagonia Sul, we are looking for volunteers. And also, I know in Ibera Park, there's a very old volunteer program where there are many more different opportunities for any any person who wants to join. Awesome. Yes, in, in the case of Chile, in Patagonia National Park, we offer internship programs for helping us, particularly with the Darwin's Ria program. And we are going to open a volunteer program for Cerro Castillo, where we are going to start building the Wemul Rescue and Rehabilitation Center. So we are going to keep you posted. We need more hands in the territory. Keep us posted, absolutely. We, I mean, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to share both of these organizations, both stories of rewilding Patagonia. Last year, it was great and in a year the progress that was made is, is so exciting so it's 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 really fun to see year on year progress see success see the community being involved um you two are doing great work and i know you have a whole team behind you as well who who make everything possible yes yes definitely the yes. team is everything <laughs> excellent well Deanna, Joe, and, uh, uh, before uh, i leave hmm? yeah go ahead sorry no it can't before I leave, I, I don't want to leave behind uh, to mention that we are very excited to announce a new project in the Magallanes region. Uh, we are working for create new national parks down there. 
uh, because we want to, we are working not to cons only to consolidate the legacy of Douglas and Christine Tompkins, but also to expand it. So uh, we have some new parks on the pipeline uh, in, in, in the Magallanes region, and we are hoping to create uh, national parks on land and marine parks on the water. So we are going to expand the protection of, of Patagonia, and that's what we, we wanted to share with you as well. All right, very cool. Thank you for sharing that with us. It's always great to hear about more, more space being set aside for parks. That is just absolutely great news. All right, well, Deanna and Marcella, thank you so much for being with us. A huge shout out to Tompkins Conservation and Rewilding Argentina and Rewilding Chile uh, for being with us. Thank you for putting together those beautiful videos. Uh, and of course, you can check them out uh, in the playlist as we get the playlist up or even just rewind which we're playing right now if you want to check it out again. So thank you so much, Marcella. Thank you so much, Deanna. Uh, and I can't wait to hear an update. Thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Nice. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Okay. Well, we are going to move uh, to Africa, to Nigeria. We have a great speaker coming up. Mark uh, was backstage just a moment ago and then he popped out. So I'm thinking that maybe there was a little internet interruption. So we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that we see him joining us again shortly. Um, but a quick couple quick reminders as we do wait to see uh, if Mark's able to reconnect. I really hope it's not a power issue because sometimes uh, in Nigeria they can have um, some power going out. Uh, so I really hope that we can get Mark in and share his pangolin story uh, so fingers crossed that we see him popping in backstage shortly, but I do want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, keep up with what's happening, globalbiofest.com. Uh, uh, you can find those details there. You can find the schedule. We made a couple little changes to, to Saturday. So do take a look at the schedule. We've shifted a few events, uh, around with a new speaker joining us. Uh, you can check out Sunday as well. And then you can check out the website as well. If you want to donate, uh, to the festival. Uh, the money that is donated to the festival goes to grassroots conservation organizations. This festival is 100% a nonprofit festival. Uh, everybody you see hosting today, organizing the festival, uh, no one's getting paid to do this. We're doing it because we love uh, biodiversity. We love sharing the stories of the scientists, uh, the conservationists, the explorers uh, all around the world. So speaking of explorers, I can see my good friend Joe Cutler hanging out backstage. He's just kind of getting ready. Um, but I think I'm not sure quite quite what happened with Mark. I think we might have uh, we might have lost him. We may have lost him to the internet. So I'm going to give things one more minute uh, to see if he's able to come in uh, and join us. And then, uh, as you know, what usually happens here when we're jumping all around the world is that uh, we start to run a little bit behind schedule. Um, but we usually do make up time as the day goes on. And I can see Joe, I can see the beautiful Agui River uh, in the background. So I'm just gonna check my email one more time to see if I, if I have anything from Mark. Um, okay, unfortunately I don't see anything. So maybe, maybe we'll bring Joe in for a bit and maybe we'll do a little hybrid. If Mark does pop in, maybe we'll say hi to Mark. It's, it's two different locations in, in Africa, but we'll, uh, we'll make things work. So. Uh, I'm so excited to invite my good friend, Joe Cutler, uh, in to join us, an ichthyologist, a, an amazing conservationist, a National Geographic explorer. He has spent so much of his time uh, in Gabon and really exploring the biodiversity, particularly the fish species in uh, Gabon. He, if you spend time with Joe, you can't help but just love fish because uh, his passion is infectious. He's generally knee deep, waist deep, uh, in the water. Uh, and actually, Joe, sorry, bud. Uh, I'm just going to put a, a pause on you there because I see Mark was just able to rejoin. I know Mark was having trouble joining. So Joe, uh, if you want to stay in or if you want to duck out for a little bit, I can I, I can WhatsApp you as well um, when, when things are looking good. Sorry, Joe. Uh, let me bring Mark in here right now. Mark, we thought we lost you for a minute there. Yes, um, I was having network issues, but I'm good now. Can you hear me? That's okay. We, we can hear you. We can see you. Uh, so I have Dr. Mark Ofua joining us. He's a veterinarian who set up an animal shelter in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city. Uh, after five years ago, uh, or sorry, more than five years ago now, probably, Mark, six or seven years now? Yes, about seven. All right. 
So along with dogs and cats, he's increasingly finding himself rescuing wild animals, including one of the world's most endangered, the pangolin. So he raises orphan pangolins, um, saves them from the bushmeat trade so that they can be released back into the wild. Mark, it is so good to see you. This is the second year you've joined us. And, you know, the, 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 the work you're doing, the growth of the conservation work is so impressive. Thank you so much. Thank All you right. so much. It's, it's what we have sold ourselves into and there is no turning back. <laughs> All right. Well, look, Mark, I know you want to share your screen, a little presentation. So uh, if you want to go ahead and do that, I'll, I'll bring it up nice and full screen for us. Okay. So let me attempt to do that. Yeah, I saw you uh, backstage earlier and, and uh, testing that screen share and it was looking nice and good and I see it popping up okay, now. So can, you see, can you see my screen now? I can. Yep. Yep. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to bring this nice and full screen now, and then it's all yours for a little bit. Okay. Can you just uh, hit the... Oh, there it goes. We're good, Mark. All right. And you can see me too, yes? Yeah, we've got you on screen as well. Okay. So um, thank you very much, Joe. Um, thank you, everyone. Welcome to Africa, welcome to West Africa, and welcome to Nigeria. Um, my presentation actually is going to be a story. Um, I've been seeing wonderful presentations so on some scientific and all that. And uh, I'll be telling you basically our story so far. So the, the title for my presentation is Rescuing Pangolins in Nigeria, the story so far. And I remain Dr. Mark Ofua. Ah, okay. Um, I'm sure the story from Nigeria, from Africa, hasn't been too good. Uh, and we're trying to see what we can do to change the status quo. So let me start by highlighting the problem for us to, that would be a good start of point. Now, first of all, Nigeria has. Um, made the news as the hub of illegal pangolin trade from Africa worldwide. Now, um, we have a lot of Asian presence here in Nigeria, the Chinese. You know, they have this strong presence in Africa. And, uh, sorry, excuse me. I have a friend who is disturbing me. <laughs> All right. So, uh, most of the seizures of pangolin scales everywhere in the world, in Asia, in uh, Vietnam, China, have all been traced to Nigeria. That's the pangolin scales. And then even the um, pangolin, uh, the whole pangolins traced here to Nigeria too. Now, it's important to say that Nigeria, although is not the source of the um scale seizures the scale that are seized but because we have a very weak uh, border protection the entire west african belt you see pangolin scales even all the way from central africa you see pangolin scales finding their way into nigeria on for export and uh, in the course of my work what i have come to discover is you find these guys the, the shipping uh, agencies, the Chinese that we have here that are into logging or charcoal trade or something, they use this as a, as a, a cover for the pangolin smuggling, pangolin scale smuggling. So what you have is containers that are full, but actually it's the top half that has the timber or the charcoal or something, the lower half, is loaded with pangolin scales and all that. So this is how the pangolin scales are smuggled out of the country. Now we have very good laws. Our laws are about 70% okay, but enforcement is zero. And that is where the bane of our problem is. There is very little enforcement and nobody really cares and all that. And when you try to push, they'll tell you that, look, people are hungry or we've not finished taking care of people. And then you're talking about um, wild animals or something. 
you know, and then there's that cultural aspect too. Bush meat consumption is seen as a part of the culture, and there is really no interest to push for the enforcement of the protection of these animals. Another problem we have is lack of awareness amongst people in authority and enforcement. Now, people in authority, these are people that are to make the laws. These are people that are to make the laws to protect wildlife. They actually do not, from my experience, I find, they actually do not understand why wildlife should be protected. They tend to see it as, um, like they have a soft spot for animals, so they are pushing for protection. They do not see it as, an intrinsic part of our existence, protecting nature, protecting wildlife. So you find that that push to protect is not really there. And then the law enforcement also, or the arm also what is expected of them to um, enforce these laws. It, 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 I was surprised at, uh, at um, uh, an exhibition uh, recently, about two years ago, and you find custom officers seen a pangolin for the first time, not knowing what the pangolin scale is or something. So how do these people now protect a pangolin when they see it in somebody's hand? Instead of protecting, what they do is they bring out their phones to take good pictures, to post on social media or something, because they do not even know that this animal is a pangolin and that it should be pro it's, uh, protected by law and that they are supposed to enforce it. So these are part of the problem we have. Another thing is the low interest in conservation proper. Now, in a country as big as Nigeria with all the diversity we have, you want to see so many conservation bodies or interests bringing up. But you find out that there is very, very low interest in that angle. And it will surprise you to know that we, St. Mark's Animal Rescue Foundation, is about the only wildlife rescue center in the entire country. And now that is a huge problem because I see ourselves as just like um, the tip of the iceberg or just like a drop in the ocean, we are not up to 10% where we should be yet. And if we are the only wildlife rescue center in the entire country, then you can imagine what the problem is. You know, we have other conservation bodies, but they are more interested in either raising rangers to protect uh, the national parks or something. But rescue centers that would rescue wildlife from bushmeat, educate people and all that, it's very, very, there are very, very few in the country. So these are the problems that we face. And it's against this backdrop that St. Mark's Animal Hospital and St. Mark's Animal Rescue Foundation has come. So what we do at St. Mark's basically is, I see, started from my passion for wildlife. I go to this bushmeat market and um, interface with hunters and all that. And whenever I make a rescue, whenever I, there's a seizure or something, I take these animals, I rehabilitate them, and released back to protected forest. Now it started with any kind of animal, any wildlife that I get from birds to reptiles, to mammals, to amphibians, anything I lay my hands on, I rescue, rehab and release. But in one of my forays, I came across a pangolin and that was what started my love for pangolin. That was what started my passion for pangolin. And in one of my forays to the bushmeat market, where I, I, I was actually going to rescue a pangolin. Right there on the table, one of the captive pangolins gave birth to a baby. Now she was so weak, she was barely breathing. I think she used her last strength to push the baby out. And that was Juba, the one on the left of the screen. The, the one on the left of the screen. And of course, when Juba came, I didn't know anything about raising orphan pangolins. I cried out for help. I reached out to friends outside the country, friends from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Tiki Highwood, and all of them. They came, they were, Pangolin people are wonderful people. They rallied around me. We came together and we were able to raise Juba successfully. We raised him for about nine months plus before we released. And after Juba, Iriti came. I think Iriti was the, was the topic for my presentation last week, last year, her entire story. It was beautiful. So, but with Juba and Iriti, I started gaining experience. And um, it also, they are, th these two pangs actually shaped my perception and uh, my mindset about the rescues. Now, there's an element to my rescue that is controversial. 
because uh, I know buying of uh, wildlife from these poachers, from the sellers, as a form of rescue is frowned at. Well, I didn't care because my passion is what drives me. I do what I have to do. If I can talk them to release the animal, beautiful. But if I have to part with money, I don't care. I've seen this animal. I must rescue this animal and I go all out to do that, you know? So uh, that's, I know I have been managing. But with these orphaned babies, the babies, they are, when they are born, the mother usually dies about a couple of days later. And the baby died too. The baby is of no value to them. They usually chuck them away or throw them away to die or just ignore them on the ground or something and then they die off. So getting these babies off from them, I don't have to buy, I don't have to pay, you know. So it, it turned my focus towards starting a pangolin orphanage, you know. And uh, I've been able to have this relationship with them. Whenever there's a baby born in captivity, oh, they call that madman that would come would come charging like anything to get the baby to raise and all that. So that is how we started the Pangolin Orphanage. Um, this video actually shows the opening of the soft release sites, uh, the first of its kind in Nigeria. Uh, we started the orphanage. So in the orphanage, we pay more attention to babies that are born in captivity or pregnant mothers that are re uh, rescued from captivity that are born in the hospital and then we raise them. Now, raising a baby pangolin is a whole lot of work, not to talk of what we did next. Well, we, <laughs> there was a time in that orphanage, we raised the number from one to two to three to four and to five babies. I think that is a record anywhere in the world. Uh, we're raising five uh, babies at once and I think for now, because of manpower, we're pegging it at five babies. Um, the one on my shoulder right now is one of such babies. Um, we, at this point, we were actually overwhelmed. I had to cry for help because feeding a baby pangolin, they eat very little, just about 20 to 40 meals of formula. But one baby would spend about 40 minutes to one hour taking 40 meals of formula. So when you have five babies, then you're spending about five to six hours on feeding the pangs alone. And that's, you do that three, four times a day, you find out that you're spending about 15 to 20 hours just feeding these babies in a day. So it's really time consuming and uh, the work. And then we have other animals to attend to who are basically self-funded. I run a small animal hospital and it's from the proceeds from the small animal hospital that we run this orphanage. So it's a whole lot of work by Staff, they are overworked and double worked, but because of the passion we have, we enjoy it and we take volunteers. That Maria Deckman from Rest Namibia, she came to volunteer to help us with the babies. She was um, really helpful and we had uh, a nice time with her. So that is the work staff for St. Mark's. That's how we basically work with the uh, pangolins. We raise them, we feed them, exercise them, and then as they grow to be about seven months of age, we start introducing them to ants. And then by nine months of age, we take them to the field to forage and uh, to forage in the forest by themselves. You know, it's usually very funny when we introduce these pangolins to wild ants. Uh, immediately you take them to the ant nest or something. When they perceive these ants, they are all excited and geared up because they can smell food. I think their natural instinct kicks in. And then they, they, starts scratching, the, uh, digging into the nest, and then you see their tongue flickering at a very fast speed, fast pace, feeding and all that. But of course, the ant won't take the invasion line down. The ant will fall out to engage the pangolin. And when the ants start biting the pangolins, you see this shock, <laughs> literal shock on the face of the pangolin, and they run away, practically like run away. And it will take a while again, maybe a couple of visits before they ever even go near the ants again. Uh, but after a while, they start getting used to it that, oh, there is this um, food that you have to get that fights back. And what we do is, as the animal age, we start reducing the formula so that they get more hungry and then they depend more on foraging. And we, you know, we do that in percentages and then we weigh them every day 
you see that the animal is actually foraging and putting on weight and not just walking about in the bush. And then we do this. And then when we see that the animal is able to get up to 90% of its food from foraging, we actually stop the formula and then the animal is weaned onto ants. That's when we now take to the soft release center that we showed earlier. Yes, that's when we now take them care to the soft release center. It's a large piece of land that we have fenced around. The fence is about um, 33 feet high. And the last part of the fence is made of sheet metal so that they can't climb out. And then we keep them there and then monitor them for another couple of um, months. And then when we see that they've done very well, we now release. Now, this video you're seeing is a very, is a wonderful um, experience we had recently. It's sometime in January and it's very, very uh, particular to me. We released a batch of five pups. You see how big they are. They range in from about nine months to about 15 months. These guys are already fully able to forage by themselves and all that. And for the first time, we're not just releasing them, we were able to get radio tags on them. You can see the radio tag on the tail of the pangolin. We were able to get radio tags we get what had somebody that sponsored us that donated and we were able to get radio tag and put on them. And so we released them, but this time around, we're not releasing on faith. We were able to monitor them. We go to the forest with a radio um, antenna. We track these animals and we see them doing very well. And um, yes, <laughs> so that's very, very um, emotional for me because for once we, are able to see that our work is yielding progress and these babies are actually doing well post release. And now, after um, the release, this is one of the sightings we made. I think this sighting was made about a month post release because sometimes when we do the radio, the radio has its um, limitations, it's not like a GPS. The radio tells you the area, the particular area where the pangolin is. But if the pangolin is up asleep on the tree, you won't be able to see it. Or if it's in the dense foliage, you might not be able to see it. But you know it's there. But once in a while, we're able to make sightings. And this is one of such sightings. We tracked this animal and we saw it's broad daylight. You know, pangolins are usually thought to be nocturnal. But we saw this guy, it was about 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And he was having fun and foraging and being the king of his forest, you can see the radio tag on his tail, and he's doing very well, and all that, you know. <laughs> you can see that. So, for once, we're able to have sightings and see that this animal is doing well. That was a sighting we made. The animal is high up in the tree, foraging and having fun, you know. So, we're able to monitor these babies that we tag. We had just funded for three pangolins and we're able to tangle three of them and we're able to monitor the three of them doing very well this is another one high up on the tree foraging and playing and having fun still in the daytime so we see that pangolins are not just nocturnal they are actually active during the day as well depends on how it suits them so um that was another sighting um this was one of the females we put near the river you can see the tag very close to the tail doing very well, foraging and ignoring us typically. So for the first time, we're able to see that these babies actually are doing very well and they don't have any problem surviving in the wild. This sighting was done about three months, it was done last month, I think in April, that's about three months post release and they're doing very, very well. So that is a picture of me tracking them on radio, it's the protect is in a park in a protected forest and we're tracking them and we can see how they're doing we can see that they're doing well and all that so it's a lot of work remember after tracking still have to go back to the clinic to feed <laughs> the new set of babies that's another day tracking this was when we found the baby up on the tree now um uh, like i said the the problem is multifaceted and what we're doing is just a part of the solution, it's not the entire solution. We are rescuing, rehabilitating, and releasing to the wild. It's just a part of the solution. Now, the other problem that we have identified, we are doing our best to see how
we can mitigate them. So I actually couldn't get the picture for this uh, slideshow. Uh, I have partnered with um, the Nigerian Customs. We're training their officers on identifying these uh, white lights and how to make proper seizure and how to handle seizure and also to send to us for rehabilitation. We've had very huge success in that. And then also we, the education parts, we, I partner with schools, we educate the children on the need for conservation of the species. So I go from school to school teaching them. And not just that, we organize uh, like um, uh, programs where kids come to us, they learn about these animals firsthand, and then they learn the reason for conservation. The truth is I have come to realize and discover that children are a very good way to get to parents. They will take this message to the parents and educate their parents. But not just that, we also hope to break that special circle of ignorance, you see, that is passed on from generation to generation. So we're raising a generation of kids that are aware of the environment, that are aware of the need for conservation, and they're going to take this message. And when it's their time to look after the environment, they will do very well. And not also only that, we go to social media. I partnered with um, an international organization, World Aid. That is Peter Knight of World Aid. We go on, we go to, we have uh, what we do with media, social media, print media, news media, and we keep passing on this message of conservation so that people would know. We do media campaigns and we're engaging people and the, 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 we're beginning to record some success. And the, the current uh, 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 situation right now in Nigeria is we have legislation protecting wildlife that is being uh, developed by the uh, various houses of uh, Senate. That is beautiful. The extant laws, they are developing the laws and strengthening them. And then they are also um, increasing penalties and all that. I think this is a huge win for wildlife in Nigeria. And uh, when the laws come out, the laws, we expect the laws to come out in a month or two from now. It's going to be handed over to law enforcement. Remember, we've already trained law enforcement, the police and customs, we've had various trainings with them. And I know in before the end of this year, wildlife protection in Nigeria is going to take a roundabout turn. Now, we have two bushmeat markets shut down by the authorities. This is a huge win. These are markets that have been in operation for decades shut down. This is a huge win for wildlife. We have an increasing range of wildlife ambassadors that are preaching the gospel. And for the first time, to the best of my knowledge, in Nigeria, we had a sting operation, not on pangolins anyway. I, uh, I got information about a manatee that was being, uh, that was um, um, uh, in captivity and was, they were planning to export. And we led a sting operation with the authorities. We were able to rescue the manatee and release back to the wild. So it's a very huge win for me. And um, I'm grateful for the impact I, we have been able to make on the face of wildlife. And I'm happy that these pangolins, they have uh, a, 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 an option, a chance to survive in Nigeria by the activities of myself and my staff and like-minded individuals in Nigeria who are set and bent on changing the face of wildlife in Nigeria. Thank you very much for listening. That's my story. All right. All right. What, a great, what a great story it is, Mark. I don't know how you're, you're concentrating with the pangolin on your shoulder looking for ants in your ear. I don't know how you're doing it. <laughs> these, guys, these guys are very interesting. They play a lot and they, <laughs> they have toys, they play and they, 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 they communicate. Very interesting animals. <laughs> Well, congratulations ah, on the opening of the, the Pangolin Orphanage and having them back into the wild with the trackers and being able to keep track of them. When we first connected a few years ago and we talked to students, I remember the way the students' eyes lit up when they saw the Pangolin. Uh, yeah. And, you know, then it was just you were talking about it, wanting to do it. And I'm so impressed with the progress you've made. Uh, you're making such a difference uh, you, for Pangolins in Nigeria. Thank you. So I want to share a link here. I want to share a link to your Instagram. Uh, and then on the Instagram as well is a link. It looks like a link to the website as well where people can learn more exactly. 
uh, where they can likely donate to help support the program, which is so important, right? Without donations, uh, you're not able to do the work that you are doing. Where this is most important now is with extra help, we can actually increase from five pangolins to maybe 10 in the orphanage. We yeah. need to get more yeah. manpower and increase our base of operation. I look forward to it. I can imagine five are a handful. I saw the picture where you had them coming on. So you're probably grateful for those volunteers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so cool. Absolutely amazing. On the chat, everybody's so excited. There were some viewers from last year uh, who who were nervous that they, they weren't going to see a baby pangolin. And, and when they saw uh, our friend make that appearance, it, it made their day. They're so excited to see. Uh, and it's so it's so tough, too. They're such a charismatic species, but they are one of the most trafficked on the planet. And yes. so... I can imagine it, it's it's you, you get ups and downs, right? Days that are so exciting, but days that are that are low as well. When yeah. oh yes, oh yes. If you if you if you lose one of your rescues, it's like the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. But with the, the the release, actually, I didn't talk about the release. The release makes up for all the work, all the sweats, all everything. When you make a release, it's like a spiritual moment and. Nothing compares to me, I can assure you. <laughs> I, I can only imagine. I'm going to put you full screen, Mark, because half hour goes, oops, they put me full screen. No one wants to see me. They want to see you. Uh, <laughs> half hour goes so fast. I can't believe it. Mark, thank you. Thank you for so the work. this is Seed. Yeah. Seed is uh, about four months old. <laughs> amazing. Four months old. Uh, yeah. And how long before, uh, um, you know, being able to be released in the rehabilitation center? So we start, the release comes from about nine months. Yeah. Nine months at nine months of age, they hit about 1.2 kilograms, which is a good time for them to release. So between nine months to about 15 months, depend on how well he's able to adapt to the wild. That's when we make the release. All right. Well, Mark, again, thank you so much. I'm going to share one more time this banner up here to jump onto the Instagram, follow along, uh, visit the website as well, and help make this dream go from five pangolins to 10 to 20 to whatever's needed. Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Joe. All right. I look forward to talking to you soon. Uh, have a great thank rest you. of the weekend. Thank you so much. Cheers. All Bye. right. Okay. Oh, it's hard to just tear away from that. That's amazing. Mark, thank you so much. Now, I already started introducing Joe. Joe Cutler, my good friend, uh, ichthyologist, National Geographic Explorer, doing incredible work uh in gabon he recently uh did the um Agui river mega transect so over a thousand um kilometers maybe it's miles joe will correct me uh down the river sampling biodiversity this hadn't been done in over a hundred years uh you can find it africa's last wild river i'll post a link uh to the instagram up shortly and so joe back in gabon which is uh you know a place he loves to be uh, and he is now the director of research at Lope National Park and manager of the station des Etudes des Gorillas et Chimpanzees. So, oh, I'm going to bring Joe in now, live at the Ugui River. Let's see him. Joe. Hi, Joe. Hello, everybody. Um, this is the Ugui River um, here in Lope National Park in Gabon. Um, and as Joe said, I'm an ichthyologist, an aquatic ecologist. And I love exploring rivers like this, in particular, the fish biodiversity. In 2020, we paddled down this river from way upstream about 600 kilometers to way downstream about 400 kilometers, eventually reaching the Atlantic Ocean um, and paddling the route of Pierre Savignon de Braza about 150 years ago. So that was my past work. And now, uh, as Joe mentioned, I'm the director of research for Lope National Park, and I'm the manager of the Station des Etudes de Gorilla Chimpanzee, which is about 12 kilometers or eight miles south of where I'm standing right now. And if you're wondering where I'm standing, we're just a little bit south of the equator. If you looked at our latitude, it would be south 0 0.10, and our longitude is about 11.58 degrees east. So we're just a little bit east uh, of where the prime meridian is and just a tiny bit south of the, the equator. And 
as you can see, the Uguwe is a large river. Um, in fact, it is the fourth biggest river in Africa in terms of flow. And right now it is big and swollen. We're approaching the end of the rainy season and the water is quite high. In the dry season, we'd be seeing exposed rocks all across the river here. And the sand that we're standing on would continue for another 10 or 15 meters beyond where I'm standing right now. It also means that fishing at this time of year is really difficult because a lot of the areas where you want to fish are actually underwater and inaccessible in the big water. Um, to give you an idea of how wet the rainy season is, we had a bit of a storm last night and had 29 centimeters of rain, about 11 and a half inches or about a foot of rain in one night last night. So the river itself is actually rising right now as all the tributaries dump their water into the Uguwe. It's a pretty exciting thing. Uh, and my role right now at the Station des Etudes des Gorillas Chimpanzee is to, to do baseline analyses of fish biodiversity. Now, Lope National Park has been protected for over 40 years. It's the oldest and largest national park in Gabon. But until we got here, there had been no one who really focused on freshwater fish biodiversity in Lope National Park. So there is a lot to discover. I've spent the last few days traveling to this river or that stream or this swamp and throwing my cast net or placing my traps or taking my little dip nets and scraping the banks trying to catch every fish I can. And just before joining this call, I did about an hour of fishing here with my cast net, but I thought it'd be a good thing to throw the cast net a couple times during the call to see if we could catch a few fish and uh, show off what it is to, to study freshwater fish biodiversity here in the Uguwe River in Gabon. Um, and, and one of my favorite techniques, which is cast netting, or in French, l'épervier, which means hawk. So I've got my cast net right over here and I've got a bucket to put fish in and I've got an ice chest with some fish I've already collected. So just in case I don't catch anything, I can still show you some biodiversity. Now, the thing about cast netting is you need to be really well organized. You need to make sure that there's no knots in the line, that there's no kinks in the net. And this net is quite long. As you can see, it's much taller than I am. And so I've got to really make sure that everything's nice and organized and clean before I go to throw it. Now, all these are little weights. And so I've got to make sure that when I throw this, the weights spread out in a nice uniform pattern so that it'll fall a bit like a pancake onto the water surface. So I take a first handful, throw it over my shoulder, and then I start working my way down to grab another handful. All right, here we are. Everything's clean, everything's clear. I'm going to throw right out here, kind of on the edge of this eddy. Perfect. It's not every time when you throw it that it turns out like that. Hopefully we'll catch some fish. All that and a good cast and not a single fish. Maybe we can try again a little bit further downstream. There's a, there's a few rocks right here and there are a lot of fish that like to hang out right around the rocks. So now I've got to re-clean re this, make sure it's, it's nice and clean and that there are no kinks. All right, here we go. And I'm going to prepare myself before I go downstream because when the fish see me, they're going to try to swim away to escape. So here we go. Getting nice and organized here. All right. And you can see in the backdrop there, Mount Braza or Sovi Sovi. It is one of the most famous features in Lope National Park.
So my goal is to throw it right on that little submerged rock that you see there at the far end of this little rocky band. Looks like I've got a few. All right. Now the nice thing about these cast nets is it's pretty easy to, to get the fish out of them. They're not stuck or tangled. All right. Now each one of these, they're actually the same species. These are all labio anectens. And I'm gonna take these, and I'm gonna put them in the, in the ice chest. But before I do, let me show you how beautiful this fish is. You can see the tones of green and purple on the scales. And in the, the common name for this species, Labio anectens, is the Ne Galu, which means gall nose. And you can see right here on the nose, it's got all these little tu tubercles, um, which during the breeding season, they become really pronounced in the males. Um, and it's used to attract females. Now this fish is a sucker. It's got an interesting sucker disc mouth. And that's why you find them a lot on the rocks. So this is a species that's adapted to fast moving water with a rocky bottom. Uh, there are other catfish that are similar that have the sucker disc mouth um, that we have here in Gabon. Now, I have a few other fish that I caught over the last hour here in my ice chest. And I wanted to just show you a little bit of the biodiversity that we have here in the Ugué River in Gabon. Now the Ugué has about 350 described species of freshwater fish. You won't catch all of them with a cast net, but you can catch a lot of the biodiversity. So right here, I've got a beautiful Rikon Ethiops macrops. And you can see, whew, you can see that nice green color on its back and the nice orange fins with the white tips. Really a nice looking fish. Actually a cousin of the South American piranha. What else have we got here? This, this is a freshwater herring, a Polonula vorax. And if you, if you can see, if I can keep it still enough, you'll see that the, the nose is almost transparent. Now this is a filter feeding fish. Um, and they live in the open water here on the sandy banks of the Ugué. Now I have not seen any of these Polonula vorax in the smaller streams within Lope National Park. Thus far, I've only caught them in the main stem Ugué. I've got a few more species in here that I'd like to show you. This is one of my favorite fishes. This is a Hemichromis elongatus, also known as a jewel cichlid. Now during the breeding season, these fish turn intense red and the black bars that you see on the, on the flanks of the fish become even more pronounced. Now this little cichlid is actually a very intense predator. If you look at its, its teeth under a microscope, they look just like the teeth of a, of a carnivore. Um, they're sharp, spiny looking teeth, much like you'd see in a, in a leopard or a cat um, or even a dog. Um, and it's a very aggressive predator in the shallow, stagnant water ecosystems. All right, this is maybe, it's small, but it's maybe the most beautiful of the fish that I've got here today. This is a Brachypetersius Lamberti. And you can see that nice kind of green color on its back and the little black spot here on the, on the caudal fin. And then you can see how long this 
long and filamentous this dorsal fin is. Really a nice miniature fish. And this is an adult. This is as big as they get. And a lot, a lot of the fish diversity here in Gabon is quite small. Now that's not all the fish diversity. There are huge freshwater stingrays. There are large migratory snappers that come all the way from the coast, get to Lope and keep going upstream. Um, and, and then there are huge catfishes and very large labiobarbus, which are called yellowfish. At least that's their common name. I've got another labio anectens here, the same one that we caught with the cast net. And this one, you can actually, woo! <laughs> woo! It was a jumper. I want to show you this fish's nose in particular. You can see how well developed the tubercles are on this one's nose. And that indicates that it's actually a male um, getting ready for the breeding season, which is really interesting. All right, just a few more fish to show, and then I will open it up to questions. All right, this is one of my favorites. This is a Disticotus hypostomatus. And if you can see, its scales are much smaller than any of the other fish I've shown. It's also got one of the weirdest mouths of any fish. I don't know if we can zoom in on the mouth a little bit, but the mouth is totally downturned. And this fish is actually a detritivore. So it swims around eating dead and decomposing matter all around on the bottom of the, of the rivers and lakes. Now these fish can get quite large, um, at least, you know, like this big. So this is a juvenile, um, but they're really fascinating fish. Now this next one, I've got to be a little bit careful because it's very spiny and even venomous. This little catfish that you see here is a Chrysichthys oguensis. Now there are lots of Chrysichthys species, but this one actually is named after this river. It was first discovered in the Ugué, and it's really distinct. When you look at the head of this fish, um, it's got a really wide, flat mouth, whereas most of the Chrysichthys have a tiny, almost pointed snout. So when you look at a Chrysichthys from the top down, you can easily distinguish whether it's a Chrysichthys oguensis. Now, you can't hear it, but I can actually hear this fish croaking, and it's actually just grinding its bones together to create a little sound. Um, it's pretty neat. And last but not least, I've got one more fish in here. Now this is one of the most common fish on the Ugué. This is a Coptodon Thelone. Now it's not the biggest individual ever, but this is an adult. Um, and one of the things that I found very interesting when we were doing our exploration of the Ugué River, when we started 1,000 kilometers away from the coast, we caught this Coptodon Thelone. When we arrived at the ocean, we caught this Coptodon Thelone. They are literally at almost every single site that we fish, we catch these fish. Now you're not gonna find them out in the main channel. They're not great swimmers. You find them really close to the banks where the water is a bit still. One of the things that's really cool about exploring fish biodiversity is you learn where different fish species are going to be within a river system like this. Not every fish is gonna be out in the current. Not every fish is gonna be on the banks. And it also changes daytime to nighttime. If we continued our sampling for about two more hours until the sunset here, we would be catching totally different fish. All sorts of little catfish would come out from their hiding places and uh, we'd be catching different diversity. So it's really important when you're studying fish to use multiple sampling techniques 
and the sample both during the day and at night so that you can see all the different diversity that's present in an ecosystem like this. So that's a bit of a tour of some of the diversity here in Gabon's rivers and in the Ugué in particular. We still have a lot to discover. So on my previous, throughout my previous work, we've calculated that about 10 to 15% of the fish species that we collect are completely new to science, have never been named, have never been discovered. So anybody who's interested in studying new species, maybe naming a new species, come to Gabon and come and study freshwater fish with me. It's a lot of fun. With that, I'd like to take any questions if there are any, uh, and then I'll get these fish back into the water where they'll be happier. All right, Joe, thank you so much. That was amazing. Your, your cast netting technique has improved so much. I remember we did uh, events with classrooms all the way down the Ogui River. Uh, and initially you were kind of showing it off and good casks, but wow, those ones were epic. I can see the practice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, once you've thrown a cast net probably 10,000 times, you'd expect that I'd get a little better with time. So Joe, the first question that came in is what led you to Central African freshwater ecosystems? You know, a bit of luck, a bit of interest, a bit of chance. So I've always been kind of a fish freak. I love fish. I studied fish when I was an undergrad. I, I have fished my entire life. But I, I didn't expect that I'd be working in Central Africa until when I finished my undergraduate work, I joined the U.S. Peace Corps and I was stationed in Cameroon. Now, while I was an agroforestry volunteer and I was working a lot with the national park and with local farmers, I found that there were volcanic crater lakes all around the landscape. And I got to be the person to go and fish in those lakes. When you're one of the first scientists to go and fish an ecosystem, it really is exciting. And uh, it's truly just discovery. Every time you pull a net through a new river or a new lake, you don't know what you're gonna catch. And I fell in love with it. And luckily I've had the chance to keep doing this. Um, for the last nine years, I've been studying freshwater fish biodiversity in Central Africa. So hopefully I'll be able to do it and, and make it a life. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned that the river wasn't well sampled. Um, there wasn't a lot of, of, we'll say, ichthyology work going on, fish scientists. And I think that's something you're working to change as well. A new generation of, 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 of Gabonese ichthyologists. Yeah. One of the things I'm really excited about is working with local scientists and, and also working with local students who want to become scientists. There are so many cool things to explore that even if I fished every day for the rest of my life, I would never explore every river system here in Gabon. So the only way to really study it is to train people, empower other people, and have them work in collaboration to go and survey these, these systems. So for example, Lope National Park has never had a thorough fish biodiversity survey. That's one of the things I'm doing right now. But there are 13 national parks in Gabon and none of the other ones have had a thorough inventory of fish. So maybe I will start with Lope and then maybe it'll be another explorer and another ichthyologist working in Mukalabadudu and Luongo and the Ivindo and the Bateke Plateau. There are so many cool areas to explore. Absolutely. Amazing, Joe. I hate to pry away from this. This is such a beautiful view. I'm going to make it full screen again here. The river is beautiful, nice and swollen. The fish are amazing. We've got the lovely Megan behind the camera uh, who's just been rocking the views. Thank you so much. Joe, I'm getting out there. I've got to get out there and spend some time with you uh, uh, and Megan as well. Thank you so much for being so dedicated and passionate uh, about your work. I have no doubt it's rubbing out or rubbing on to anybody who, who you meet, uh, all the students you're able to meet, uh, just incredible stuff, Joe. Thank you, Joe. It's great to be able to share with uh, the Global Biodiversity Festival and the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants audience. Thank you for including me. And uh, please come out and visit anytime, Joe. We'll do lots of hangouts from the field. All right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Megan. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Happy World Biodiversity Day tomorrow. 
Thank you. You too. All right. Okay, I'm going to bring in uh, a shift change. We've got Lizzie backstage again. Bring Lizzie back in. Lizzie, explorer and educator extraordinaire. It's so good to see you Saturday. Hi, Joe. It's great to be here today. All right. Well, I'm going to disappear for a little while. I'll be back in a bit to take us into the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. But for now, I'm going to let you take over. Great. Thanks so much, Joe. We are staying in Africa for another presentation, and we are headed over to the other side off the coast of Madagascar. I'm going to bring in our next guest, Prashant Motion. Hi, Prashant. How are you? Hi, Lizzie. I'm good. And you? Great. It's great to have you and great to have you for our global biofest today. Um, a quick introduction for everyone on Prashant. Prashant is a National Geographic young explorer and the founder and expedition leader of the Oceanic Project. And today he's going to be sharing his work that's supported by National Geographic and the United States Embassy in Mauritius. And it's going to focus on engaging youth to explore, educate, and take action to protect our ocean. I'm very excited to hear more about your work. So we'll go ahead and bring up your presentation and I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, Lizzie. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Prashant and I'm from Mauritius Island. So I'm gonna share a little bit about my work um, with National Geographic and the United States Embassy. So for those of you who don't know where Mauritius is located, so we're just a small island in the Indian Ocean with a population of 1.2 million. And we also have some outer island, Rodrigues and the Chagos Archipelagos. And uh, I grew up in Mauritius, actually, and I spent most of my time exploring because um, I live in the capital and they, behind my house, there is the third highest mountain. The third, in the first picture, you can actually see the, the third highest mountain in Mauritius. I spent most of my time exploring as a kid and I really like taking photographs. And uh, I got my dog, who is my buddy. We explore a lot of mountains. We hike a lot. And I really enjoy hiking. And in the, in the third picture, you can see um, the city view of Portlis. So when I explore, I, I explore, I take a lot of risks. And I have explored some beautiful places in Mauritius where people have explored. I explore caves. And it's just living in tropical island, just really beautiful for and flora. But also, I do take risks as well. So I just I break my legs many times but it was the adventure too and uh, from my adventure um when i was a kid i really liked taking pictures so um after taking pictures i really liked painting them so i was really creative when i was i was i was really creative and i'm still creative um i majored in graphic design so these are some of my paintings that i did and in in the last painting it is actually a biodiversity of mauritius and uh there is the dodo who has gone extinct. So uh, when hiking a lot around Mauritius, I didn't pay much attention around me because I was young and I didn't notice much. I really, I was really thrilled for the adrenaline adventure. But I, when I grew up, I started looking at things differently. So there was trash on mountains. So um, I was really curious where trash goes when the, there's heavy rain. So. Um, one day I started paying more attention when there was heavy rain and all the trash got into canals at the foot of the mountain. There's a canal, so it goes into the ocean. I live 15 minutes from the ocean and just behind my house, there's the third highest mountain in Mauritius. And I was really curious where this goes into the ocean. I didn't know about that because I haven't learned about the ocean. I haven't learned much about the ocean in school. So I had less knowledge about life below water. And... Uh, then with a group of friends, we started hiking. We started hiking more. We started collecting trash. And you can see in the in these pictures, we have collected the massive cleanup. We collected over 600 kilos of trash. And I finally understood that trash goes into the ocean, but it must be going somewhere. And um, then I started, I was someone who went from fearing the ocean to protecting it. I still remember um, I did my undersea walk back in 2014. and. I took a lot of courage to do that because I was someone who was really scared of the ocean. So I noticed that um, when I did my first undersea world, it was a magical world. It's it's really magical. And and then I saw coral reef, and I didn't know about what is coral reef. For me, it was just an underwater structure with no importance where fish love to play. So part of that, I didn't learn about coral reef in school. I had less knowledge about 
life below water. So my school textbooks didn't answer part of my question. And I saw during my undersea walk, I saw some really beautiful coral reef and there were some who were white and black. So bleach and some who were dead. And I wanted to know more about why there was more fish around the, um, the vivid coral reefs, the beautiful ones, and why there were less fish around the white and uh, black ones. So I started doing my citizen science research. I started exploring and started taking more and more courage. I started scuba diving, uh, free diving, scuba diving in, back in 2016. I started discovering more and more um, the important role of coral reef, which is home to my, millions of um, species. So I started doing my citizen science research, which uh, Founded, I found my niche in, into the ocean. It was um, I really love the ocean because if you love something, you want to protect it. And uh, so when I found my niche, I founded my organization, which is the Oceanic Project. And then we started taking more and more action. And uh, I was over the moon when I was selected um, as a 2021 Young Explorer. So uh, most of my work focuses on uh, using the power of storytelling to educate and take action to protect our ocean. And um, Back in 2016, I took this photo of shallow water corals, which is not really good condition. But I also explore deeper corals. I do deep diving, cave diving. I have dived with whales, sharks, dolphins, turtles, living in small islands. Just really wonderful exploring these waters around Mauritius. And but also that is uh, climate change. Like I have mentioned, pollution is uh, increasing more and more because uh, mo most Mauritians find it an easy way to get with a waste. So um, in, in the first picture, this is where I took this picture on the, on the mountain. This is where most of the trash get into the ocean. You can imagine there's a lot of trash. We had the torrential rain, which causes death to um, 11 people. So it was back in 2013. So there's a lot of trash and most Mauritian, I think most Mauritian are less educated about the journey of plastic. And I start exploring more and more to understand. So at, at, at the end, um, exploring more and more the ocean, the I understand coral reef, I started taking more pictures, story and careers awareness on my social media. And I have seen coral reef, I witnessed coral bleaching. And um, when when I dive, most of the time I dive, I have dive, dive all around Mauritius. And one of my favorite places to go diving is on the West Coast. It's really beautiful. I really love sunset. And it is also recognized as a Mission Blue. And we are collaborating with the first Mission Blue champion in Mauritius. So in the first picture, you can see the coral reef are really in bad shape, bad condition, less left coral reef. And um, the water quality is, is quite bad as well. And But this place in, in the last picture, in the fourth picture, that this place is recognized by Mission Blue as a hope spot. And there is, there's a lot of dolphins there, more than 4,000 dolphins, whales, and they, they migrate to Mauritius and uh, they come all the way from South Africa, Madagascar, and they, they come to Mauritius. It's way really wonderful to see these whales coming to Mauritius and just play around. And um, this is why it is nominated as a hope spot. And my work is mostly focused, focused on this specific area as well. So with my organization, we use storytelling to explore, educate, and take action to protect our ocean. So. Throughout my change making journey, I got the incredible support, which I'm really grateful. I got incredible support of the United States Embassy, and they are really supporting our work by amplifying what we are doing and also supporting by creating more and more events and uh, campaigns together to joining us in any of the events that we are doing. And um, as a diver, most of the time when I dive, I carry a mesh bag with me and uh, we find a lot of trash in the ocean, find a lot of trash. So I'm also a Body certified diver with a speciality dive by um, Body Aware, so which is the dive against debris. So I, I dive with purpose. We record uh, debris that we found at the bottom of the ocean, and uh, it's quite you know the journey of trash is going everywhere in the ocean. And we just found trash stuck in coral reef and uh, fishing lines, and I record these debris and we do um, clean up on land and underwater as well. So I, I have developed an education program with the support of a National Geographic Certified Educator in Mauritius. And the program name is Cobra Squad. And the meaning of the Cobra Squad means that the bonding with the postman, um, meaning that they are carrying coral reef protectors. And uh, we've had collaboration with the 
expert mindset, we can um, bring together more and more innovative solutions. And you know, each of one has a unique perspective. So we do educate them, and we have explorative session and also cover restoration. So this is our field trip, and it is supported by National Geographic. We um, engages the youth in exploring a marine protected area and also in the marine park discovering um, coral reef species and why certain fish depends on that. And uh, we did that um, six, uh, six weeks ago and the participants were just um, really happy exploring life below water. And it was a really unique experience because um, many Mauritians don't um, try to explore life below water because they, have, they, have, they fear the ocean, we haven't learned much in school and uh, also um, th their fear might be um, might be in drowning stories and uh, something like that. So our postman was really thrilled and discovered life below water. There were fish all around, coral reefs, some were in good state, some was in a bad state. So after that, we do beach cleanup. And uh, one of our aim doing beach cleanup is not only collecting trash, but what we can do with trash is raising awareness. And um, with trash we collected, we do um, message in the bottle, which is something really uh, creating we found, creative. We found that uh, making more people around where, where we are based at um, our neighbors, our surrounding, where our organization found out. So showing that we have a message in the bottle and um, this button by um, there are some bottles going into the ocean. And our message and pledge is that um, you can take a step forward by stop using plastic bottles. And this uh, ocean virus was just a really creative idea by our education lead. So we did um, a powerful message that COVID uh, has impacted more of us, most of us. So our virus for the ocean is um, plastic and all these uh, debris, cigarette butts, and uh, many, many more debris are in the ocean. And, and then one of the things that um, we do with my organization, we have uh, recently welcomed our our cohort of 12 educators. So uh, we are based in a hotel in Mauritius on the West Coast. So this is our space where we do educators training, um, youth training. And these um, educators are actually sustainability officers of hotels. So we, we are part of a group hotel, Veranda and Heritage Resorts. So these educators are sustainability officers and they have a space in every hotel, a youth space where these educators now are running the same Core Squad program. And it is a project that we are more and more involved for the future and assist in to give more youth around Mauritius the opportunity because most of our hotels are based um, on, on the coast and uh, we're getting the really good engagement of the local community as well. And also we can engage more and more youth to be on the front line in the Core Reef Restoration. So these are some inspiring new educators with, that we have welcomed recently. And, and then one of the last thing is that coral reef restoration. So I have no background in marine biology, but if you tell me to restore corals, I can definitely do that. And I have learned most of the how to restore corals by exploring and understanding how we can um, you know, make coral reef drive and restoration. So in part of our program with National Geographic and the United States Embassy, we do the active coral reef restoration and we do, um, we engage our postmen how to you know, uh, cut corals and also do the active restoration. And one of the things is that when they hear coral restoration and nursery, they don't know how to set up a nursery, but we show them how to set up a nursery and uh, plant coral reef and how to get that into the ocean and also how to monitor that. And um, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, this is our cohort and uh, with our National Geographic Yellow Border. So that's uh, my work um, with uh, National Geographic and the United States Embassy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was absolutely a wonderful presentation. Um, couple of questions. It's such inspiring work. Your, your, your own artwork is absolutely beautiful. And the artwork that is being created with the educators is also beautiful as well. And definitely you can see how it shares the, the story of what's actually in our oceans and how, how to protect them. Um, when you look at the, is there a difference when looking at different sides of the island and the coral reefs and the wa water quality? Um, have you seen any differences in that? Yeah, I would say that 85% uh, of the reef in Mauritius are actually impacted, but there is hope as well because we are launching a new 
educational program where we can engage youth to risk soccer. It's not rocket science, but the youth are really inspired. They find a niche and they, they feel that there's a need to risk soccer and they, how our life depends on the ocean. So um, we, don't, we don't really pay much attention that 85% of the careers are affected, but we pay more attention that you know, we must respect what we got and uh, protect what remains. And this is the mindset that we're just planting the seed so that they can continue to keep that momentum going. So we're really looking forward to bring Mauritius on the spotlight, do some incredible work here. Yeah. And how many locals would you say you've gotten involved in your project so far? Ah, so three years we started that. So I started that three years, but the educational program was recently back in two years so mostly 500 yeah back when i started that we've uh, i started working with a diving center we started doing more and more in spring and we did some summer camps some schools some awesome sorry for my alarm going off <laughs> i'm a teacher and that's when our recess ends <laughs> during the school day <laughs> um that's amazing. 500 people in just that short period of time. And I'm sure it's only expanding. Are there, do you see that it kind of is spreading within the community that people are getting involved and getting excited and then that it's kind of through word of mouth or are there other ways that you're getting out your message? Yes, actually the program was the first one in Mauritius that is, um, has been recently endorsed by the UN Ocean Decade. And it pays, it had paid more attention to the youth and we got the Ministry of Blue Economy here in Mauritius, which got the attention of our program. And he also joined us for our explorative session, um, which supported by Nat Geo. And he was really inspired by that program. And he said, hey, we need, we need to get this program and more and more involved around Mauritius. So really, really looking forward to expanding more and more that program. And uh, with the help of the United States Embassy, and also with the, our educational lead, with our Mission Blue Champion, we got a really great network together, but we, we are still working on the expansion because we, now we do have uh, 12 educators and they are leading more and more around Mauritius, all around Mauritius. So we're just uh, getting more and more youth in, involved into that project. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we're excited to hear about how your project continues and where it goes from here. It's definitely inspiring to hear about and to hear your journey from seeing some of the trash in the mountains and then thinking about where all of that trash ends up and getting inspired to just go into the ocean and take that brave step when you were totally terrified at first <laughs> and look at where you are now. So thank you so much for sharing with us today at the Global BioFest and for all of the work that you do. Thank you, Lizzie. All right. So we are headed next um, over to a totally different part of the, the world. I'm not entirely positive which part we're headed to, to be honest. We have a speaker joining us named Natalie Schmidt. And Natalie is an empathetic um, ecologist, a conservation geneticist, and a documentary presenter. And she's deeply passionate about protecting biodiversity using hard science and public education and community empowerment. She's going to take us on an adventure today um, from Antarctic blue whales to snow leopards to caribou to learn about how some of the very cool ways that DNA tools can help us study and protect rare and elusive species. Um, and she's also developing this leading edge technology to detect DNA from minute biological samples in real time with error free and low cost and easy to use. So I, for one, am excited to hear about that. Natalie, welcome to the Global BioFest. Gosh, Lizzie, hey, it's so nice to meet you and it's so nice to be here. I'm actually speaking from Canada. I know I'm, I'm an Australian living in Canada, so that's, yeah, <laughs> that's where the confusion lies, maybe. <laughs> that's all right. And with the diff the, all the different species that you're studying, you never know where, where you might be. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. But yeah, I'm so grateful to be here and uh, excited to tell everyone, tell our audience about my very eclectic journey as a conservation geneticist. Yes, we're excited to hear it. It looks like um, if you can just try and share your screen again, it looks like it Ooh. just popped out from behind us. Okay, so how do I? Oh, I need to. I see. Share it again. Uh, let's try. Okay, can you see it now? 
Yes. All right. I'm going to add and... it in. Oh, no, it went away again. Oh, <laughs> it was there for a second. That's strange. Let's try that again. I wonder why it's doing that. So, okay. All right. I see. I'm going to add it. All right. Do you want to try and go to full oh. screen and see what happens? Oh, maybe that's it. Oh, when I well, when I click stop, uh, hide screen or hide. I have uh, a quick thought here coming in the, yes. the voice from backstage. Ooh, that's the voice. This time when you share, choose that first option for entire screen. It tends to be a little friendlier uh, to go full screen. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, oh, okay, entire screen. So if I go like that, but then how do I go to my... How's that? Can you see it? Okay, let's pull it in. I yep, Oops. it's good so Hello. far. Okay, we. I still Can you have. See it? it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no <Nope>. technology. <laughs> Yay. Maybe we Can do. You see my full screen now. No, maybe we do the nope. way. To... Really? No. <laughs> Maybe we do the way Joe just mentioned, but we maybe we don't go into the full screen mode of the presentation, but just go through slide by slide. Oh, well, that's a Let's shame. Try that. Um, okay. Just to check, Natalie, when you're going full screen, are you mm -hmm. hitting the hide first or are you hitting the full screen option? I'm hitting the full screen option first and then the hide. Okay. Maybe I should just not click the hide. Yeah, let's give that a go. Let's try <laughs> oh gosh okay entire screen i'm clicking on that share then i'm going to go to my oh my my presentation okay. all right i'm not going to click all right now i'm going to how's that that looks good Woohoo! okay i'm going to duck in the okay. back and take it away <laughs> Sorry, everyone, for that uh, technical glitch, but uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to be part of this Global BioFest, and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you a little bit about my very eclectic journey as a conservation geneticist. And actually, that's the beautiful thing about working with DNA is it can take you on so many different avenues of conservation. And like everyone that's attending this conference, I've I've always had such a profound love for nature and really wanted to devote my life to protecting it. But I've had to take a few, you know, twists and turns, changes in direction and focus to work out how best to do that. So in a past life, I actually started off uh, in animal behavior, studying these uh, very happy little wallabies. I'm sure you've, you've heard of these guys, the quokka. Uh, that, that live in the southwest of Western Australia, which is where I'm from. And I even gave up five years of science to pursue documentary film um, uh, as a documentary film presenter because I thought that I might be able to make a, a greater impact in conservation uh, by doing that. But it, it wasn't until I discovered uh, the beautiful potential, the amazing potential of genetic tools uh, that, that I really found my passion so what, what are genetic tools? So genetic tools are basically DNA sequences that are unique to an individual, a population, a species. And they can tell us lots about animals, plants, pathogens by the remains that they leave behind. So fecal samples, skin, bone, hair, saliva, basically anything containing DNA. And using these tools, we can, we can assess abundance, we can, um, we can measure connectivity between populations, we can monitor biodiversity or biodiversity loss, and we can even track uh, individual movement. And I just love how versatile this biological tool is because I'm just interested in so many different things. I don't know exactly what I want to study, so it suits me very well. And these tools are uh, very useful for helping us to learn more about rare and elusive species or, or animals that are really difficult to study. And I'm particularly interested in those rare and elusive species that live at the planet's extremes. So 
as a kid, I was deeply inspired by my great grandfather, Charlie Sandell, who uh, was part of Sir Douglas Mawson's Antarctic expedition from 1911 to 1914. And I was so lucky to be able to follow in his footsteps, um, at least going to Antarctica with a PhD on the population genetic structure of humpback whales in the South Pacific and Australia with the Australian Antarctic Division. And I then went on to study the largest animal that's ever lived. Does anyone know what that is? That's right, the, the Antarctic blue whale. And this was an absolute dream come true for me. I mean, virtually nothing is known about this almost mythical creature that was reduced to less than 300 individuals in the mid 1960s as a result of commercial whaling. And I became involved in a study that looked to identify individuals using skin biopsy samples as well as photo ID uh, to see if we could get uh, uh, an accurate estimate of their circumpolar abundance in the Southern Ocean. Now, trying to find uh, an Antarctic blue whale in the vast Southern Ocean is a little bit trying to find a needle in an ocean full of haystacks. It's <laughs> It's really, really difficult. But luckily, they vocalize very loudly and at very low frequencies. So we can actually detect them from over a thousand kilometers away, which, which, which continues to blow my mind. So at the Australian Antarctic Division, we have these very clever acousticians that develop this, this amazing methodology where they throw these microphone arrays over the side of the ship uh, and then when an Antarctic blue whale is detected from three of those microphone arrays that we call sonoboys, then they can make a triangulation and actually place the ship within two nautical miles of that individual that's vocalising. And, and us observers on the deck can easily see that massive tall blow on the horizon. It's, it's phenomenal that we can hone in on an animal uh, from over a thousand uh, kilometres away. And as part of this research, we actually made some really uh, amazing kind of non-intentional discoveries as well as intentional uh, discoveries. So while we were testing the methodology of the southeast coast of Australia, we literally bumped into one of the rarest whale species in the world. So this species has only previously been uh, described from dead specimens and a, ha a small handful of sightings, and we managed to get photos and video. This is Shepherd's Beat Whale. Wow. So amazing. And in the Ross Sea, we discovered this massive feeding aggregation of over 100 Antarctic blue whales that were just gorging themselves on krill. And I can tell you, this was one of the most amazing things I've ever witnessed in my life. I mean, Imagine being in the middle of these giants feeding. It was just, it was incredible. And then we became the first team of people to successfully deploy a satellite tag on an Antarctic blue whale. <clears throat> and for that, we had to get up really, really close. Now you can see by this photograph, the sheer size of this animal compared to us. And let me tell you, we're still actually quite a distance away from this individual. So they're even bigger than you can see here. <laughs> and I want to play you a video clip. I'm hoping that this works and you can hear the sound of that exact moment that we deployed that tag. Okay. So this is the culmination of everything that we've worked so hard for. This is two years of work. We're excited, but we're also absolutely petrified because so much can go wrong in this very moment. We have to get the tag, the skin biopsy, the photograph all at once, otherwise we miss our opportunity. We start to see the animal surface on the right-hand side and we accelerate and woo! <laughs> Bang! Whoa! Oh, that, that clip still gives me goosebumps. I'm like shaking as I watch it. And you can see the uh, biopsy dart um, that my colleague is holding. 
and it has a little skin sample at the end of it. It literally bounced off the whale and landed in the boat and that absolutely never ever happens, ever happens. We usually have to scoop it up in the water. <laughs> so this particular animal, uh, we tracked it for 74 days and it traveled 5,000 kilometers. And what's really interesting is uh, this guy liked to hang out around the sea ice. And there's no coincidence that krill also like to hang out uh, around the sea ice. So this guy was very hungry over its 74 days that we managed to track it. And as far as um, obtaining a circumpolar abundance estimate, we discovered that because we weren't able to collect as many samples as we wanted, um, simply because we knew we had no idea how many samples we'd be able to collect. It means our estimate is not very accurate. Uh, so our mathematicians at the Australian Antarctic Division are in the process of designing of new designing new surveys that can take this into account and allow us to obtain more accurate estimates. But as a ballpark figure, there are about three thousand Antarctic blue whales in the Southern Ocean. So they're recovering, they're recovering quite well, but they're still considered endangered and we need to protect them. But it was in the moments that I was in this little boat, the quiet moments when we're sitting in the sea ice, it's so still, a sea fog rolls in and the ship is obscured and you feel like you're the only people left on the planet. <laughs> and rather than being a scary feeling, it is the most beautiful feeling. It, it's that moment where you're in complete awe of everything. You feel connected to nature and everything. And it was that moment that I thought to myself, wow, if, if everyone could experience this type of awe for nature, then the whole world would want to protect it. And so I started to mull over this. And this was a point in my life that I then became interested in studying snow leopards. <laughs> so from from pole to peak um, i've always had such a deep love and interest in in snow leopards they're such a a fascinating and intriguing species and i've always loved this part of the world uh, particularly nepal so snow leopards uh, range from uh, across the himalayas from afghanistan through to china um, Afghanistan through to through to China um, and like Antarctic blue whales they're they're very very difficult to find and we don't yet have an accurate estimate uh, of abundance for this region for this reason and also because the range countries the 12 range countries uh, that spanned uh, the snow leopards range, use different methodologies uh, to estimate abundance. So we need to make that methodology consistent. Um, and luckily now we have um, a way of, of, of making those estimates more accurate. So we combine DNA analysis, so with fecal sampling, uh, with camera trap surveys, and we can obtain a much more accurate estimate of abundance. And I was lucky enough to, to be involved in some preliminary surveys uh, around the Kingdom of Mustang in Nepal uh, about five or six years ago with the Centre for Molecular Dynamics. Now, I thought that Antarctic blue whales were difficult to find, but these guys, okay, let me play this clip. These guys like to live above about three and a half thousand metres they like steep terrain. They, they prefer cliff edges. So of course we have to find the fecal samples from these areas. And let me tell you, each step in, low, in these low oxygen levels is an effort and a half, particularly for someone like me. Being an Australian, I like being at sea level. It's arduous. But once we find a sample that we think belongs to a snow leopard, and by the way, these samples are definitely not snow leopard, they're probably blue sheep. We, in order to verify that it is snow leopard, we need to collect those samples and send it off to a lab for analysis. And this is actually one of the biggest uh, 
challenges with snow leopard field work when we're fecal sampling is because it, it takes so much effort to collect these samples. And often we'll collect samples that we think are from snow leopard only to have them analyzed in a lab and discover they're actually from common leopard uh, or wolf. So you can imagine it, be, it, it can be a huge waste of time and resources. And I was lucky enough to, to get to spend some time with the local communities in these areas that are immensely challenged because often they have snow leopards or other predators taking their livestock and their livestock is their livelihood. And it's, it's not surprising that when I, when I spoke to them, um, that most of the members of these communities, particularly the older generation, just wish that snow leopards never existed. And in really desperate moments, they've, they've had to kill snow leopards thinking that they are responsible for, for taking their livestock. So this, this was quite profound for me. This, this hit me quite hard because I realized that I realized just how important local communities are to successful conservation. I thought, gosh, we, we need to empower these communities. We need to help to lift them or lift themselves out of poverty. Uh, and we need to ensure that conservation efforts are actually going to benefit them rather than hinder them. So I then started working with this incredible not-for-profit uh, uh, foundation called Panji. So Panji, uh, Panji is led by a Nepalese professor, Dr. Som Ali, uh, who has lived and worked in a lot of these communities. And Panji have developed this amazing um, community-led savings and credit program a uh, conservation education program, mostly with the kids to teach them about uh, their local ecosystem. And of course, the, the kids then go on to teach the parents. And then training local youth, particularly women, uh, in how to use conservation tools so that they can contribute directly to our global snow leopard abundance estimates. So this is, this is this has been an amazing experience for me and I feel very grateful to work with these guys. But uh, around this time, I then made a discovery that changed my life uh, for good, I think. <laughs> I stumbled across a scientific paper that had been developed by a biomedical lab at McMaster University. They developed this very simple, elegant paper-based biosensor for the detection of bacteria in food and water samples. And I kind of had this eureka moment where I thought if this could be adapted to species detection, then the impact of conservation on conservation would be absolutely profound and particularly on empowering communities like these ones to be able to contribute to global conservation efforts. So I literally gave up my career in as a well scientist and I left my family, my friends, my relationship and on a small amount of money I moved here to Canada to work uh, with this biomedical lab to see if we could adapt the methodology for species detection. And that was five years ago um, and uh, I, I get a lot of people asking me why would you make, why would you take such a risk, why would you make such a sacrifice? It's because the, our ability to detect wildlife from their genetic samples, whether it be fecal material, skin, bone, hair, as I mentioned, is still largely lab-based. And this is slow, it's expensive, and it requires considerable expertise, which effectively eliminates most of the world from contributing to global conservation efforts. Many developing countries simply do not have these types of laboratory facilities and some developing countries can't even send samples out of the country legally uh, to be analysed. And this has had big consequences uh, in, in conservation. So the illegal wildlife trade. So this is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, it has huge ecological, economic and national security consequences. 
but it's the inability of customs officers, anti-poaching squads, you name it, to be able to distinguish between a legal and illegal product that has become one of the biggest issues in the enforcement and prosecution of the illegal wildlife trade. And then we have what I mentioned, so monitoring endangered species in the wild through faecal sampling. Like snow leopards, more often than not, samples are incorrectly identified and it's not discovered until it's analysed in a lab. This can be a huge waste of time and resources. We need to be able to identify those samples on the spot. Wildlife pathogens. So if there's anything that we've learned from this pandemic, it's how important it is to be able to identify or detect these pathogens on the spot so that we're able to stop them in their tracks. And as I mentioned before, uh, an issue that's very close to my heart, unless we can empower everyday people and communities, then we're effectively around conservation, then we're effectively removing the most important component, in my opinion, to global conservation efforts. So over the past five years, I've been working with McMaster University and the University of Calgary uh, to, to develop a very simple technology that addresses these issues. It is affordable, easy to use, portable, um, and yet yeah, requires no sequencing, requires no heating. Uh, it effectively works in a very similar way to a COVID rapid test. So what happens is it'll, you'll get a yes or no answer. You'll get a colour change, basically validating whether a sample belongs to your target species. And the device, like you see here, um, will consist of a platform with a digital display where data can be uploaded to a centralised database. Uh, the reagents are actually dried and printed onto these test strips, which makes the whole technology, as I said, easy to use. Uh, affordable um, and, and quick, accessible, quick, portable, accurate. Now we're still uh, a couple of years away from having a prototype ready. Uh, I realized that uh, developing technology can take <laughs> longer than you think it's going to take. And it doesn't help to have a pandemic um, thrown in the middle of it. But it's been such a profound life change and uh, immensely challenging, but it continues to be such a fascinating and rewarding journey for me. As cheesy as it sounds, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that if you follow uh, your heart, it will never lead you astray and it will take you to places that your mind never thought possible. So I just wanted to end by showing you a clip about our technology and why it's so important. I hope the sound works, um, but yeah, here we go. Nelly, maybe just turn the volume up on your end. Sorry? If you, can you turn, make sure on the video that the video is, the volume is up on the video. Oh. Uh... On that right, yep, yeah, all the way up to the top. We're not hearing too much of it. One more thing, can you just unplug your headphones? Oh. struck by how 
relevant the technology is, what is the incredible potential of this technology, and I'm really clear that this is the future. Please join us. There's never been a greater urgency. And yes, thanks. I would love to uh, yeah, acknowledge uh, the funders and the contributors, but there's just such a huge list of people that are helping me on this journey uh, that I'm so incredibly grateful for. But thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, sh to share this journey with you all. I'm so, so, so grateful. Yes, well, yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? Did the sound come through? We heard the second, once your headphones popped out, we heard it. Oh, what a shame. How weird. Okay. Is it, um, is it, on, do you guys have a website yet by any chance? Yes, we do. Great. We can pop up the, um, the website so people can take a look and take a peek. Is the video on the website as well? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Awesome. What, um, what's the website? It's www.wildtechdna.com. Okay, awesome. We'll pop that up on that look. That, yep, that's perfect. Excellent. So people can go ahead and take a look at that. Um, the A question for, for your technology, it's, you said it's probably going to be about two years before it comes out. And um, are you targeting certain species that you're going to kind of test the prototypes on ahead of time? Or what, is, what does that next phase look like? That's a really good question. So at the moment, we've got funding to develop this technology initially for caribou fecal detection. Uh, we're lucky enough to have funding from industry because uh, here in Canada, caribou uh, are a very important species. Uh, it's essential for industry to ensure they're not impacting caribou migratory routes. So this type of technology will allow them to make uh, very quick management decisions. But we're currently looking for funding to expand. The next phase will be expanding the technology to all the big cat species. And that... That's what I'm really excited about <laughs> because that's that's my passion, and um, we're we're partnering with the South African government and uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, and yeah, we have a lot of interest uh, with the big cats. So yeah, hoping to get there soon. That is amazing. I can't wait to stay tuned for a couple of years from now to see yes. how it all works out. The um, how do you? I know you said it's on a paper test strip, but is it a do you put it into a fecal sample or do like a saliva swab? How does that part actually work? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. So the idea would be to take a sample. So let's say a snow leopard fecal sample. We'd take a little bit of that fecal material, put it in a tube, allow it to sit for a little while in, 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 in this buffer solution. You'd then apply it to the, the, the paper surface and then the reaction would occur. And in half an hour, you'll have either a color change or no color change. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, it's very exciting. And your your life has been definitely inspiring for people who are watching and myself and so many pivots that you've made, but they're definitely connected. You can see your passion coming through for nature and conservation and wanting to make conservation accessible to everyone for all species. So. Thank you so much for joining us today, Natalie, and That's look busy. forward to learning more about Wild Tech DNA when it comes out and hits the market. I look forward to that too, and thank you so much for this opportunity, and I hope everyone sticks around for some exciting speakers to follow. Yes, well, thank you so much, and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye. Well, that was fascinating. I'm so glad we got to hear her whole life journey as well as this new technology that is coming out. I had no idea it actually takes that long to develop um, a new technology. Our next speaker that we have, I'm just as excited about. I actually got the opportunity to meet the speaker last year at our Global BioFest. Um, so I'm excited to welcome back Dr. Kristen Lear. I'll bring Kristen in. Um, hello, Kristen, welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Yes, we're thrilled to have you. Um, 
do you just want to pull up your screen share while I tell people who you are and what you're up to? Yes. So Dr. Kristen Lear is a bat conservationist and an environmental educator. Um, she's an amazing award-winning public speaker and science communicator and shares her stories and her passions, which we will hear today for bats on all sorts of platforms, ranging from podcasts to video, radio shows, National Geographic stage, even CBS's Mission Unstoppable TV show um, about women in STEM. Kristen's currently with Bat Conservation International, working on the Agave Restoration as the program manager. So I'm sure we'll hear about that today. Um, but I'm excited. I know that we're going to feel her passion and enthusiasm come through as we hear about your work. So Kristen, I'm going to bring in your presentation. Um, awesome. And I'll let you take it away from here. Sounds good. Everything good to go on the presentation? Yes, looks perfect. Okay, awesome. So yeah, thank you everyone for being here. I am excited today to talk a little bit about the work that I'm doing at Bat Conservation International to restore agave plants for pollinating bats and for people. Um, this is honestly my dream job. It's um, I've been working with bats for quite a while now, so I'm very excited to share a little bit about our work. Uh, before we dive too much into that, I want to talk a little about my journey into bat conservation because I got started at a fairly young age, um, unofficially in bat conservation. So I want to, if there's any kids out there, um, kind of share how I got started and that it's really never too early to start. And then I will talk more about our agave restoration initiative that we have at BCI. So my journey in bat conservation began when I was in sixth grade. So when I was 12 and I built four bat houses, you can see here uh, for my Girl Scout Silver Award. This was, um, I'd always been interested in bats and really been fascinated by them. And when I was doing my Girl Scout Silver Award, I wanted to do something to help bats. So I built these four bat houses in a local park in Cincinnati, Ohio, where I grew up, put them up. And that was my first, yeah, my first taste of bat conservation. And just FYI, if anyone knows bat houses, um, this was a while ago. These are not the best designed bat houses. So don't, don't take a you know, page from my book here with these bat houses. Um, after that, I continued really loving bats. And then in college, um, as an undergrad, I got the opportunity to study bats in Texas as a, an undergrad field research assistant, helping a PhD student with her bat research. This was my first time actually getting to, you know, be trained on how to catch bats, measure bats. We did radio tracking. Um, and again, I also built bat houses for my senior honors thesis project. Um, so this was, this was when I knew for sure that bat conservation was my dream uh, and my passion. So after college, I got a Fulbright scholarship to go to Australia and spend a year living in South Australia, where I studied the critically endangered southern bentwing bat um, in Narracourt Caves National Park, lived there in the national park for a year in their bunkhouse, and got to study this population of this critically endangered species. Um, and then I knew ultimately my goal was to, to earn a PhD um, in bat conservation. So I ended up at the University of Georgia in the Integrative Conservation PhD program, where my, my research was integrating the natural and the social sciences to understand the complex conservation challenge of these pollinating nectar feeding bats in Mexico agaves and people's uses and livelihoods that are based around agave plants. Um, and so this was six and a half years of my life studying these bats in Northeast Mexico, um, studying the people and working with the people to develop conservation based around agaves. And now here I am at Bat Conservation International leading our binational restoration initiative to restore agaves to the US Southwest and Mexico. Um, so this has really come full circle and honestly um, couldn't be happier than where I am right now. So let's get into this. What are, what are we doing to protect these nectar feeding bats? Uh, so a little nectar bat or you know, pollinating bat 101. There are over a hundred species of bats around the world that eat nectar. So about 8%, we currently have over 1400 species total around the world and about 8% of those eat nectar. 
And these nectar bats pollinate over 500 different plants around the world. They are critical pollinators of plants like bananas, durian, um, cacao, which we use to make chocolate, agaves, obviously, which we use to make tequila and mezcal. Um, and bats are very effective and efficient pollinators. They tend to carry more pollen on their bodies. They get covered more than things like hummingbirds or butterflies or bees. And then they also tend to fly farther distances when they're foraging. So they tend to spread that pollen over farther distances and to more plants. And when we look at here in the US and in the Southwest and in Mexico, we have three species that come up into the US, into Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. We have the endangered Mexican long-nosed bat, the one shown on the left. We have the recently delisted lesser long-nosed bat, which is a huge conservation success story. And we have the near threatened Mexican long-tongued bat, which is kind of a more elusive species that we don't know quite as much about as the other two. And uh, I wanna show these range maps of both of the Leptonicturus species, the long-nosed bat species, um, just to show how, how far they really are ranging. Um, the, the yellow is the Mexican long-nosed bat, and then the purple is the lesser long-nosed bat. And they're really ranging from southern Mexico, southern central Mexico, all the way up to northern Mexico and the U.S. southwest. Um, and what's happening during this, this range, or in this range, is it's the pregnant mother bats, the females, that are making a long-distance annual migration between their mating caves in central Mexico all the way to the U.S. Southwest. So these are some of the juvenile babies, um, the, the young pups that they have. And these mama bats, while they're pregnant, which is a crazy feat, they travel over 700 miles while pregnant to reach their maternity caves or their maternity roosts where they give birth to those babies. And along that journey, agave plants, like you can see here, provide energy-rich nectar to fuel that migration. Um, agaves are amazing, beautiful plants. They can grow 30 feet tall, and they offer hundreds of these nectar-rich flowers that the bats can feed on. And then in turn, the bats get covered in pollen. You can see all here the yellow pollen, and their long tongues go into the flowers to lap up that nectar. They get covered in pollen, and then they spread that pollen. So they're critical pollinators of agave plants. And like I said, agaves are especially critical for these female, these pregnant female and mama bats that really in, in some of these places in northern Mexico and the U.S. Southwest really are relying on agaves as their main or only nectar source. Um, up in northeast Mexico and in Texas, agaves are the only blooming flowers that they feed from. So they're very important for these mom bats. And agaves also provide cultural and economic resources for people. Um, in Mexico, agaves are harvested and used for beverages, um, agua miel and pulque, and then we have syrup here, and of course liquor, like tequila and mezcal. Um, agave stalks, like you can see here, are used for building fences and buildings. Um, the leaves and the stalks are chopped up and used to feed cattle and goats or livestock. And then the whole plants are used to, they're planted as living fences like here or used to control erosion. So they're extremely important for people too. And honestly, agaves are just beautiful, iconic parts of, of all the landscape where they're found. Um, these are other wildlife, they support the soil and, and overall ecosystem health. But more and more, what we're seeing and what those mama bats are seeing as they're migrating are landscapes like this, where these landscapes used to have agaves, but because of uh, agricultural expansion, because of livestock, grazing, because of urbanization, because of drought, these landscapes are looking more and more like this with no flowering agaves, no food for these bats. But what if we could take that and turn it into something that actually helps? And that's what we're trying to do. We've seen, unfortunately, with the Mexican long-nosed bat that 
you know, with, with this land degradation, we've seen populations of Mexican long-nosed bats crashing by about 50% over the past couple generations of the bats. So this really is a critical, urgent issue. But again, what if we can go from this to something that looks like this with a forest of agaves, with a connected corridor of flowering agaves across that entire 700 mile migratory range to support both the bats and people that rely on agaves for their livelihoods. And that's what we're trying to do. So our agave restoration initiative really is a binational effort across the US Southwest and Mexico where we're working to restore agaves near known bat roosts, so where we know these bats are using as their stopover sites along their migration, but also along that entire migratory corridor so that there is a connected landscape of nectar for these bats. And again, I wanna show these maps because um, this really shows the scale that we're working at. This is not something we can do, you know, one site and we save the bats. This is really a landscape level initiative. Um, and these are just some of the areas where we've been working. We're currently expanding our work into new areas and new sites to really create this connected corridor. And of course, this is not something that one group can do on its own. This really requires all hands on deck with researchers uh, from universities, government agencies, NGOs, communities, and even industry members all working together to plant agaves and restore agaves. And these are just some of our partners that we work with. So our approach really is kind of three pronged. So the first approach is looking at planting and restoring these native agaves near those critical bat roosts. So like I said, around areas where we know the bats are and where they're, where they're roosting. We also want to protect the current agaves that are there. So it's not just about planting more agaves. It's about protecting the healthy agaves that are already in some of these areas. And then, of course, that migratory corridor is critical. So we are working to identify where exactly that migratory corridor is and then working to plant and protect those corridors. So we currently have work happening in six U.S. and Mexican states. Um, it's a diverse landscape with diverse partners and diverse actors. And it's, it's really um, a fun, fun work to get out there and actually work with people to, to restore these agaves. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the achievements we've had to date because you know, I'm really proud of the efforts that we've done. This uh, initiative has been going for about four, three or four years now. So we're still in the thick of it and um, already have had some great successes. So we started our work in the US Southwest because you'll see here, this is an area in the New Mexico boot heel where there is a cave that both of these long-nosed bat species roost. And this area is expected to become even more important for both species with climate change and with um, potential range expansions or range shifts for these species. So we started in this area also because we have very strong partnerships with local partners in Arizona and New Mexico. And so we started by doing some pilot agave plantings. And you can see in this left picture with the Boy Scout, and he has this little baby agave, about a three-year-old agave. Agaves are quite easy to plant. They are hardy. They don't require a lot of, a lot of care once they're out there. And they're, anyone can really plant them. So we've had lots of great planting events with groups like the Boy Scouts, with mining companies, with the National Park Service, lots of diverse uh, groups helping plant these baby agaves. And we've also worked with our local partners, um, in particular our nursery partners, to create these protocols, um, booklets, detailing the process of, of agave restoration from seed collection to greenhouse um, creation to propagation of those agave seeds and then eventual outplanting into the wild. So um, these booklets we're really proud of because it's something we can share and we can use. Um, and these are on the Borderlands Restoration Network website if anyone is interested in learning more about uh, these protocols. And to date, we've uh, helped support or build seven community and nonprofit greenhouses across the US Southwest and in Mexico. 
we have 85,000 agaves growing um, across these seven greenhouses. So that's a lot of agaves that take two to three years to grow to planting size. And then once they are of planting size, we plant them out in these critical areas for bats and for people. So we've uh, to date planted a little over 18,000 agaves, but with these 85,000 growing, we're po poised to do a lot more coming up. Now shifting over to Northeast Mexico, this area is a very important uh, area for maternity roosts, particularly for the Mexican long-nosed bat, where the mother bats give birth to their pup and raise their, their pups. And in this area, the approach we've been taking is really community-based conservation, working with the local ejidos or these rural Mexican agrarian communities to develop long-term community agreements and do capacity building, help help here in this picture, learn how to do sustainable agriculture, sustainable ranching, and also incorporating agave restoration into those, uh, those approaches. And to date, we have 11 community conservation agreements in place, which is really exciting. These are 10-year conservation agreements. And it's very important that we have these long-term agreements because agaves take two to three years to grow to planting size. And then once they're planted, they take another five to 10, even 15 years, or maybe even longer to grow and mature and shoot up that flowering stock. So this really is a long-term commitment. And so far with our partners in Northeast Mexico, we've been successful in protecting 8,500 hectares of land for restoration. So this includes land where the communities are using it, you can see in this picture, are using it for sustainable crops, as well as for agave production. And they're letting some of those agaves flower for the bats, and then also be able to use some of those agaves for livestock fodder or other uses. And our partners have been really active in, in working with this, these communities. They've worked with these communities for over 10 years now um, on other projects. And they've led um, community trainings and trained currently 79 community members in the sustainable agricultural and ranching practices. So this is a much more holistic approach, like I said, than just planting agaves. It's much more holistic than that. And as part of this work, we've also been working with our local partners to train basically train the trainers. So we have um, some education programs with local uh, school teachers um, to learn about bats and then they can then teach about bats in their, in their schools. And then in protected areas, these protected area managers are learning how to do agave surveys or how to do vegetation surveys, as well as some of these conservation measures. And our local partners have really been active. Obviously when COVID came came around, it, it kind of put a damper on some of these community uh, projects, but um, so far they've trained uh, 30 school teachers and protected area managers as these environmental champions, which is really, really exciting. Now, if we shift over to the lesser long-nosed bat um, kind of range over in Western Mexico, we've been working with um, a really awesome partner, Colectivo Sonora Silvestre, to engage Bacanora producers, so liquor, agave liquor, um, like tequila and mezcal, um, to engage these producers in these practices that support flowering agaves for the bats. So they have a, um, they're working to actually include flowering agaves for bats, as well as some other um, very e ecological um, approaches into the actual um, certification for Bacanora itself. So they've been working with the Sonoran government to get this off the ground. And they, they've created these sustainability standards that include these, uh, these practices that support nectar bats and they've engaged 11 Bacanora producers in some way and are really trying to expand that to reach more of these producers. And of course, education and outreach is a critical part of all we do as bat conservationists because you know, bats tend to get a bad rap. They tend to be not as you know, charismatic as a polar bear or a koala. So we, we have to really work hard to show how important bats are and how cool bats are. 
And so we've been doing a lot of, you know, community outreach. Um, our partners do a lot of school talks about bats and school activities. We've done an annual bat fest in Monterrey in Mexico every year for the past few years, except for, you know, last year with COVID. Um, and we've also done a lot of virtual programming, which has allowed us, especially in COVID, to continue reaching people and reaching diverse audiences. So to date, we've reached over 20,000 people locally throughout all of these, uh, the six states where we work, and over 1.5 million people through virtual programming, which again, I, it always blows my mind how many people you can reach um, with virtual programming. So this has been really exciting for us. Now, the last piece of the puzzle is this piece right here. So, you know, we talked about how these mom bats are migrating from central Mexico. They're going northward up through uh, northern Mexico. And then they're, they're landing in some of these sites in northern Mexico and the U.S. southwest. And there's this really interesting gap here between uh, Big Bend National Park in Texas, where there's a maternity cave of Mexican long-nosed bats. And then there's this, like I said, the boot heel of New Mexico has a cave where both of these species roost. But we don't know how they get between those two caves. We, it, there's been a lot of um, work you know, in northern Mexico, but not a lot of work to find where these bats are migrating through to make that last leap into that uh, boot heel of New Mexico. And so we're working right now to find where is that migratory corridor. And actually this works really well after Natalie's talk about the DNA work that she's doing. Um, this will actually tie in very well to that. So I'm excited to share what we've been doing with um, using some really cool DNA technology. So first we have to find in that range in West Texas and in New Mexico, we have to find, you know, where are the agaves first of all, where, where could these bats even be with their food? So we've developed an iNaturalist project um, where people in the community or any naturalist group can go out um, and mark where they see agaves, especially these flowering agaves. And then this is the really cool part that I'm really excited about. Um, we are working to develop eDNA assays, so environmental DNA, picking up the DNA left in the spit from the bats that they leave behind when they're feeding on these agave flower, and the agave nectar. And you can see from this video, they really kind of shove their faces into those flowers. They get spit everywhere. Um, and we can collect that spit basically and try to see where these bats are feeding. Um, by the way, this is slow motion. So these bats are really rapidly eating from these agaves. But we've been working with Dr. Faith Walker at Northern Arizona University to develop qPCR or quantitative polymerase chain reaction assays that can detect all these two leptonicturous species and we're hoping this year to be able to develop a third assay that detects the Mexican long-tongued bat. So with that, with those three genetic assays, we'll be able to test swab agaves for all three of these nectar bat species. And when I say swab these agaves, this is what I mean. Um, so we tested this protocol in Big Bend National Park last year in this left picture. And what we're going to be doing this year and in coming summers when these agaves are flowering is literally create, go out and swab these agaves. You basically attach this um, Q-tip, a long Q-tip, um, to the end of a pole that we rigged up with duct tape. Um, and you just swab the agave. And you pick up the spit from the bats. And then we can put those Q-tips in a vial and send it off to the lab for testing. Um, and this, like I said, we can test for all three species, or we will be able to once we finish the work this year. Um, and then we'll be able to deploy these surveys across that whole range and go and swap these agaves to find out where these bats are going. And once we know that, we can then work to restore agaves and protect those areas for the bats. So before I end, I just want to talk a little bit about what our, what our future plans are. So where are we going with this agave initiative? So we are currently working to expand our restoration efforts into this migratory corridor once we identify the key areas, and also a little farther south into some other um, known mating or maternity roosts for these species. Um, so working with additional communities to expand the reach to that entire range where they need it. 
We're working with the governments in both the US and Mexico to establish agreements, uh, long-term either monitoring or protection agreements for these species. And we're really excited over the next year or two to really launch some community green agave business enterprises. So, you know, this is a picture here of a woman-led organization in uh, Northeast Mexico and Nuevo Leon, where they make agave products and sell them on local and regional markets. And so we're working with these communities to develop sustainable green enterprises with these agaves so they can continue having these agaves into the future. And then as part of the work we're doing, we're really looking to, to link agave restoration to food security, um, using those greenhouses, um, not just for growing agaves, but for growing local vegetables that people can eat, growing medicinal plants or growing other plants for sale on local markets. And then also tying into climate change efforts, climate change mitigation efforts. Um, agaves do sequester carbon. They are being used in some parts of Mexico for carbon sequestration programs. And so we're, we're looking to hook into that um, as we move forward with our agave work. And I want to end on this quote because I think this really encapsulates the whole, the whole initiative and why we're doing what we're doing. And this is a quote from one of the community members in Northeast Mexico who said, for us, the agave is so noble that it gives us life. And I think that really covers it all. Agaves give life to bats, agaves give life to people, and agaves give life to the ecosystems they're in. With that, um, I wanna make sure we end on time, but have time for questions. So feel free to reach out. Um, there's Bat Conservation International's Instagram and Twitter. Um, I am also on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook at Bats for Life Kristen. So thank you everyone. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kristen. That was fantastic as always. Mm -hmm. um, it's the quote you ended on, I think just as you said, sums it up so well and so beautifully. Yeah. Um, but I can imagine that when you guys are going down to kind of pitch the idea of agave restoration, the community members are pretty receptive to and wanting to work together with you. Um, mm -hmm. When you go and start restoring um, the, the agaves and in the seven to 10 years, <laughs> they take <laughs> yeah. um, How are they, how are you going to use the agaves that are restored through Bat Conservation International? Is it going to be through that kind of community enterprises that you mentioned in getting the locals involved? Is it going to be like certain farmers that get the agaves or kind of how does that equity piece yeah. of the agave? That's a great question. So um, I think it's really interesting the approach that we're taking, first of all, is very different in the US versus Mexico because it's very different you know, social systems. So, um, so yeah, when we talk about Mexico and in particular Northeast Mexico, it's the, the community agreements. What we're doing is we work directly with the community council. So they have um, a voting council, kind of like you know, a town council in, in the US. And they vote, um, they decide whether they want to have these types of projects or not. Um, and so that's the first part is they, you know, they decide yes or no. And then in terms of who gets access, we're planting on communal land and we're, we're doing these restoration efforts on the actual communal property, which is usually the majority of the land of the, the community. Each person also does have their own or each family has their own parcel of land that they plant their own crops on, but the agave restoration work is happening on this communal land where people can access, anyone can access it. Um, and it's basically working with the community to, to design um, approaches that work for them. So, you know, it's not like, you, you know, we're not saying you can't harvest those agaves that first of all, wouldn't be ethical in the first place. Um, and also we want to make sure that they can use the agaves if they need to, if something happens in the future, there is a big drought and they really need those agaves to feed their livestock. That's part of conservation. It is, that's, that's part of it. Um, obviously, we want some to flower for bats, but um, it, it's kind of working together to make sure we wouldn't get to that point in the first place. But yeah, it's not, it's not all just about the bats. Yeah, that's what I think is yeah. so wonderful about the project is that it, it really is community-based um, conservation and benefiting everyone involved. Um, okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us today for our Global BioFest. 
and for, for being here and sharing about your project um, with Bat Conservation International um, and the agaves. It's yep. absolutely wonderful to have you back. Thank you so much. You guys have a good rest of the day. I look forward to the talks. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone. All right. That was fantastic and such a, a wonderful example of a community-based project and how and why they're so important. And with that, I am going to bring Joe back in um, for our next couple of speakers that we've got. Hey, Lizzie. How's it going? Great. We had a wonderful run there. That looked like a great run of speakers, a nice diverse group of topics, and everything tying nicely together with the importance of biodiversity, the importance of community, um, and just great people, great projects. Absolutely. And I love the, the slow theme of the DNA that has been brought through as well with our speakers. Absolutely. All right. Well, Lizzie, I will say goodbye to you for now, but you're coming in for another little, uh, a little bit shortly, but we'll see you soon. Um, and now is the time where we have to make a transition. So what that means is we can only really record for six hours at a time. And so every roughly six hours, we move to a new live stream. So how are you going to find that live stream? I'm going to tell you all the different ways that you can find that live stream now. You don't want to miss our next live stream. We're going live in Costa Rica to the Osa Peninsula with Osa Conservation. Uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. So uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat here. Let me just put it there. This is the direct YouTube link to the link I'm going to activate, well, in mere moments. So that should pop up uh, into the chat shortly. I'll also share it on the screen just in case you're quick and want to take a snap of it. It's there as well. Other ways you can find the event. Well, one is just to go back to the main page of our YouTube channel, exploring by the seat of your pants, and then whatever is live will be at the top. Or you can go to our Facebook um page and we're streaming live to Facebook as well. So exploring by the seat of your pants, you can find us there on uh, Facebook. So there we go. It's posted there. The, the new link in the comments, it's right here up on the screen. I'll leave it up for another second. You can go to our main page at exploring by the seat of your pants uh, on YouTube, our channel. You'll see it pop up live momentarily. You just have to click on it or you can find it streaming live shortly on our Facebook page, exploring by the seat of your pants. Thank you everyone for joining into the very first session and we'll see you momentarily in the next session.